And hi, I'm Molly Rose from Burners Without Borders, and I'm going to be one of our MCs today. All right, um, I'm just going to get started. So hi, everyone. I'm Level Placement Manager for Black Rock City. Thank you all for being here today, and it's really lovely to see so many beautiful faces here. Um, we're also airing this live on Facebook, so just FYI, this is uh, structured as a Zoom meeting call, so you'll, you're able to see everyone else on this call. If you happen to be camera shy or don't feel like being seen on Facebook, feel free to turn off your, um, your camera. Uh, though we'd love to have everyone still remain on just so that we can see who's in the room. Um, welcome to our Diversity and Radical Inclusion Town Hall meeting. Um, this year has been quite a year as it's been for me, I'm sure it has for everyone. Um, and you know, as we, we've taken a pause from producing Black Rock City, we're also here to uh, examine the big issues within our community like sustainability and diversity. Um, Black Rock City's leadership has come together today to listen to you, the citizens of Black Rock City. Um, a town hall is a form of direct democracy in which members of our community can come together to share perspectives uh, and tell stories um, and ideas about policies around community concerns. They are a way for communities to dialogue together about how to function better. Um, a town hall at its core is community building and if there's anything that we need this year for our community, it's bringing Burning Man's community together in ways that are meaningful and supportive. And so we hope today is one of those ways. We've been trying to do it in many other ways, uh, but this is a special day. So this year with the continued growth of the Black Lives Matter movement, we wanted to create the space for burners of color to share their stories, uh, for you to share your experiences and your perspectives with us. Uh, that's exactly why we're here today. We know that diversity takes many shapes and forms, um, and there are lots of parts of our community that might be underrepresented or even feel marginalized. So over time, just know that we do plan to create spaces for these stories to emerge. Uh, but today's focus is on race and ethnicity and racism and to and anti-racism and to give the floor to burners who identify as black and indigenous and people of color. So thank you all for being here today to uh, speak and to listen. And I think uh, we'll have a really productive dialogue that way. Thanks, Lovell. Um, as I said before, I'm Molly Rose co-facilitating this town hall. Uh, we know that this conversation may be landing very differently for different folks in the room today. And some people may be feeling really excited uh, and enthusiastic that a space has been made for this conversation. Some people may be feeling really disappointed or um, upset that this conversation even needs to happen in a community that is a place of freedom and joy and is a break for so many burners. And surely there are many other hopes and feelings and desires present in the room today. So we just again wanna say that we're grateful to each individual um, for showing up where you are in this. And we're always open to receiving feedback about how we might do better in the future. Um, just wanna say that today is not intended for Burning Man Project staff to talk very much after this. It's not intended for us to show how we plan to move forward. And it is not for us to respond directly to stories that are shared here today. Those types of sessions may come in the future but today is about listening. And so with that, I wanna share our call guidelines for everyone in the room today. Our first is uh, video on if you're comfortable and mic off for all who are not speaking. This call is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. So we also do respect as Lovell said, if speakers prefer to keep their videos off. Our second guideline is to be present. Um, like I said, we're grateful that you're choosing to spend this time and join this conversation when there are so many other things to attend to in all of your lives. So we do ask for mindful attention to the speakers who are courageously sharing their stories on the internet today. And our third guideline is to think before you chat. We are asking people to lift each other up and support one another and share respectfully in the chat box today. So um, please don't use the chat box to put down any speaker. We'll be hearing a wide variety of stories and anyone trolling or bullying in the chat box is gonna be removed from the call. Um, I'll quickly share our speaker guidelines, which are that each speaker today will receive up to four minutes of time to unmute and share their story. 
speakers can talk about whatever is authentic to them. And just to be really clear, if a call participant does use any violent or abusive language towards anyone on the call um, or in any way other than directly quoting their own experience, then they will be muted and uh, removed from the call or their, or their speaking time will end. Thanks, Molly Rose. Uh, so I wanted to walk you guys through a little bit about the structure of today. Um, what we have is two hours, a little less than two hours now, uh, but two hours to storytell. And so we have over 30 people who signed up to actually speak live. And so thank you in advance to all those folks for uh, stepping up and, and doing that. Um, time permitting, we'll also try to have an open mic. So there might be folks that didn't sign up and feel inspired to speak. Uh, we want to give some space for that. Um, if time doesn't permit, we're actually, you know, we're going to end the formal part of this town hall at 7 p.m. Pacific time. But if you would like to stick around, you feel really jazzed and energized to, to still speak, um, some of us are going to remain on so that you can have that time. And we're going to record it so that it can be incorporated into like the final edit of this. Um, we do, we're recording so that we can actually share this out with the community uh, for folks that couldn't make it during this time. And so if we're able to have that open mic, um, those stories will, are gonna be incorporated as well. We also have a couple uh, recorded statements that were submitted and written ones. So just know those are other ways um, that we're capturing information. We know not everyone uh, feels totally up to speaking live on camera in front of lots of people. Um, we also intentionally chose this uh, Zoom regular Zoom meeting format with like the Hollywood Squares because we thought it was good to have us all see each other. You know, uh, I'm sure you guys have been in uh, webinars where it's like the people that are in the audience are just chatting with each other in chat box but don't get to see each other. So um, we intentionally did it this way so that we could just see all your beautiful faces. Um, and I'm gonna kind of kick it off before we get into the speaker speaker list uh, with some introductions of some key people we thought it was important for you all to know. Um, so what we've asked everyone to do that's part of Burning Man staff is to include their name and their title or their department name and their preferred pronouns um, in the name box. So if you wanna scroll through the participants list, you'll see that uh, we've enabled people to be able to chat with each other uh, so if you have a direct question, you are able to do that. Um, but then we also wanted to highlight just uh, some really quick under one minute welcome remarks from uh, key people on our staff. So I'm going to start uh, with Harley K. Dubois, one of our cultural co-founders. And Harley, you're up. Hi, thanks everybody for being here. I'm really excited for this evening. Um, I'm one of the six cultural co-founders. I'm also on the Burning Man Project board. Um, I work in the office day in and day out, and the most meaningful work that I'm doing these days is with diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, the only thing I wanna say is that I have always been in service to this organization and to the participants that make Burning Man happen. Um, we are certainly doing our work on the board level. Um, individually, we're doing our work, our, um, governing entity, you know, our, our, um, our nonprofit is doing its work, but the power has always been with the people of Burning Man. And I'm so excited to be here tonight and hear what everyone has to say, because this is what's gonna drive us forward. Thank you. Thanks, Harley. Uh, next up, we have Dennis Bartels, who is president of our board. Dennis. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm a board member of the Burning Man Project, and I see a number of our other board members here on this call as well. Um, I know we can do better, and I'm really here to understand all the ways how. So thank you for this gift and for this opportunity to learn. Thank you, Dennis. Um, next, I'm gonna call on Heather White, our Chief Operating Officer. Thank you, Level. Uh, my name is Heather White, and uh, I am here to listen. I am part of this community because I believe in human potential, and I've seen so much transformation um, among all of us, and I'm ready to see more. So thank you for being here. I appreciate that it's time in everyone's life to be here in this conversation, and I'm really grateful that you're here. Thanks. Thank you, Heather. And finally, we have uh, Chaos, also known as Chris Neary, who is uh, the head of DPW. So Chaos, take it away. 
Hi there, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. I am the Associate Director of Event Operations, uh, responsible for the Department of Public Works and our event infrastructure. And I'm here on behalf of our event operations team. And uh, I am really grateful to all of you for telling your stories this evening so that uh, we can all learn more about how to improve diversity, not just in BRC, but throughout Burning Man. So thank you all. Thanks, Chaos. Um, there's a few other people that I want to just point out and recognize before we get started with our speakers. Um, we created a diversity, equity, and inclusion stewardship group here at Burning Man Project. And uh, so Harley's on that, Molly Rose and myself are on that. Um, but I also want to acknowledge uh, Pedro Vidal, who is our People Operations Director. I'm not going to let, I'm just going to name them so that they don't have to say hello, but you want to look, if you want to look them up on the participants list, they're there. Uh, Dominique Dubois Dodley, who is our senior communications manager. Um, many of you may have seen things he's written or posted about diversity, equity, and inclusion through our Burning Man Journal and Jack Rabbit Speaks. Um, and then Patrice Mackey, also known as Chef Juke, who is uh, our user, su user success manager here um, at Burning Man Project, but also on the DMV Council. Uh, so we're all here. Um, there's many more people that uh, deserve acknowledgement, but we just don't got time. So going to move right on to our speakers. Um, and we wanted to, uh, we've kind of queued up, like I said, about 30 speakers who are here um, to tell their stories. So uh, just as a reminder to those speakers, feel free to just unmute yourself. And when I call on you, uh, we'll start the clock. And again, there'll be hopefully a nonviolent bell ring that comes out to let you know that 30 seconds, you have 30 seconds left to talk. Um, all right, so we're gonna start with Alfredo. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, um, or good evening, depending on where you're at. Thank you, uh, first and foremost, for uh, the opportunity and for putting this together. Uh, I have been attending Burning Man since the American Dream in 08. And I've been there 10 times at this point. Um, and it's something that's obviously been uh, an important factor uh, in my life. It's been transformative in many of the positive ways that you can imagine. So uh, I, again, am, am grateful for the opportunity to speak to all of you. Uh, I'd say really the theme of what I wanted to share is about uh, creating a, a more, more safe space, right? It's already a safe space, but I think it's important to further that and make sure that it permeates in everything throughout the the communication. I think that uh, Burning Man is not necessarily a place that I've ever associated with racism or race being a problem that I've had to experience there. It's quite the opposite. It's one of those few few places where I've had a chance to let go of that and uh, to focus on simply the freedom of the event and having a good time. However, I do feel that it's important for the organization to let it be known what that brand is about, right? That it's about uh, inclusivity, that uh, things about exclusion or classist behavior are antithetical to the event. Uh, and I'm really appreciative when I see things like the support for the Black Lives Matter movement, because it tells me that our values are aligned, right? That I am a welcome member of this organization and that there is no doubt or question about that. So I think that type of behavior has been incredibly helpful this year. I have seen some of the resistance online. I think that's always going to be part of the dynamic of the conversation, but I do think it's important that you continue that. Uh, it is going noticed, and I do appreciate it. I'm sure many other people do. One other thing I'd say about creating a safe space is the legal battles that I've seen happen over the course of time. I think as a person of color, uh, growing up in the U.S., you don't have a choice but to be vigilant. Uh, it's something you're taught from early on or you learn very quickly through your own life experiences. And so that vigilance is one thing that you get to kind of let down a little bit when you do go to Burning Man. But in the years when there's been a contentious uh, relationship with law enforcement, I think a lot of that played out on the playa. It didn't, it didn't disappear when it got time to, to, to the event. And so I do have specific stories where I felt like the behavior of law enforcement was a little overly aggressive. There was a too hard of a show of force. I'm sure that wasn't exclusive to people of color, but I did have a personal experience that I think was reflective of the, the tone uh, that particular year or multiple years where that's happened. And I think it's important to take that into context and see if there's something that can be done in preparation to the event 
Maybe it's a particular training that can happen with rangers, something else that can be happened to aid more mediation, uh, de-escalating events, so that uh, just really creating a safe space for people that otherwise see red flags and radars, because I have seen that go off before, and that kind of steals away from the magic of the event uh, that otherwise exists, right? That's the whole fun of Burning Man is that it, we've created a utopia. So I, I'd ask you to consider that and see if there's more that can be done there in the event that those kinds of um, legal battles happen again. And then I, aside from that, I'd really say that I, I hope you continue the dialogue. I think you have a lot of enthusiastic people in your network, uh, myself included, who would always be open to having the conversation, to trying to figure out ways to solve, to contribute, to find actual solutions. And so uh, I encourage you to please keep doing this and to, uh, to, to find a way to be more, to, to, excuse me, to continue the inclusivity because it really is a transformative event. And I think there's a lot that you'll see uh, in return by, by putting that out there. So I appreciate all of your time. And uh, thank you again. I, I, I want to just reiterate that I do love this event and I hope uh, this has been helpful to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alfredo. Um, I'm going to just line folks up in the queue. So Yodasa Williams is next, and then Safira, and then Ramiro Martinez. So Yodasa, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for creating this space. I want to share that for me, I am extremely grateful for what Burning Man has brought to my life. I attended my first burn in 2014 and at that time I was a completely broken person and felt extremely disconnected from the desire to live and I feel and credit my experience that happened that first year with Burning Man with reigniting my inner child my connectivity my love for humanity and my desire that I wanted to be a part of life and share something and create things and be one with the world and that really started my urge when i attended that first year as a person who had gone through a lot of trauma and found this place of healing this magical place i found like i wanted to figure out how i could share it with other people who were living in hurt living in trauma living and needing the beauty of creativity and magic and connection that i saw existed at burning man through this community and um one thing that happened my first year that kind of like started the the pinging of alarm to what i feel like we're we're talking about today is i remember you know just riding around the camps and it was after like really feeling transformed and like alive and loved and seen and somebody yelling out you're 40 41 and like yelling out like i was like the 40th black person they had seen and I remember like talking to some other people and they were like, yeah, it's like a thing that happens at Burning Man. They like count out how many black people they can find each year. And I thought that was really a strange part of the culture. And there have been other things that have happened or other anecdotes that I've heard from other burners of color where we have met up against, you know, this, this wonderful gathering of love and connectivity and feeling seen. And then this feeling of like, oh, you're an other because you're a black person in here. And oh, there's something weird and different to you being a person of color in here. Why are you really here? And so part of that, I feel like is something that hasn't really been addressed in the culture and I feel very grateful for things that Burning Man has brought to life that have helped me improve as a human um, you know especially like the consent culture at Burning Man I feel like it's really communicated well and consistently but this culture of, of insidious racism and oppression and otherness for people of color within the culture is something that I feel like is is needing to be addressed more it's not just something that I'm concerned about obviously we're all here concerned about it and just also the not only of creating safe spaces but making sure it's consistent in the language and in the communication that this is not a culture that tolerates otherness racism and how people can be treated especially right now what's happening in america and making sure that is something that is clear that is not accepted in burning man and in burning man culture and that's something that i really hope because i feel like there's so much benefit that burning man can bring 
especially to people who are suffering, people who are going through trauma, people who need to find themselves. And I would want there to be more of a welcome culture for people of color, people who are going through things and need this kind of home and space. So I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to share what I have gained and um, hope there can be more conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Adasa. Um, we are going to actually put someone else in the queue uh, earlier, and her name is Beverly. So Beverly, you have, uh, you have the stage. Hello, I'm Beverly. And um, on Playa, I'm Miss Jackson, if you're nasty. And I have attended Burning Man every year since 2015. In 2015, I became a Temple Guardian volunteer. And I was a volunteer 2015, 16, and 17. At the end of 2017, at the end of that burn, I came home to discover some really heinous social media posts. And I was appalled. They were posts written by a fellow camper of mine, a woman who I had camped with in an all white camp in which I was the only non white burner. And she was advocating for more curbside justice. She was expressing her delight and her support for police brutality. And I was appalled because this lady and I had broken bread together. So I wrote her a letter expressing how I felt, telling her that I saw her posts, that I understood where she was coming from, that it was her right to feel that way, but that when we were in camp together, here were my boundaries. She never got back to me. Instead, Instead, she wrote me, uh, she, I'm sorry, she never wrote me. She wrote to the temple guardian director and asked him to deal with me and deal with me he did. He told me that it was her radical self-expression to post her support for police brutality. He told me it was her radical self-expression to be as racist as she wanted to be and that I had no right to set any boundaries with her in the form of that letter. He told me that I was to reach out to her. He issued me an ultimatum. He told me that I was to reach out to her. I was to try to see the good in her. I was try to understand where she was coming from or he would take me out of the Temple Guardians. Well, I flatly refused to do any of the above, and he took me out of the Temple Guardians. I was Temple Guardian voice for two years. I was a volunteer for three years, and he kicked me to the curb. Now, the upside of this story is after two years, I finally got the org to pay attention to my story and they're finally addressing it. So I'm not here to plead for a seat at the table because according to the 10 principles, I am already radically included. I want you to hear what I'm saying. I'm already radically included. So what I am here to say is that I will not be a second class citizen in Black Rock City. I love Burning Man and I will keep going back every chance I get because it is one of the greatest experiences I ever had. But white feelings do not take precedence over black feelings. White burners' rights do not stand greater than black burners' rights. And so I'm here to say 
that as much as I love Burning Man, and I do, and I'll be back every chance I get, I will not be a second-class citizen in Black Rock City. So, the 10 principles say I'm included. I'll be back. Thank you for listening to my story, and I'll see you in the dust. Peace. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Uh, next on our lineup is Safira and Ramiro. And um, I know folks are also kind of giving snaps and stuff in chat, so please, yeah, please share your thoughts there. I know we can't immediately respond verbally, so that's our best way. So Safira, you're up. Hi, I hope you all can hear me and see my screen. Um, I'm Safira, and uh, I appreciate having these moments to share with you my experience. The several photos provided are from my camp, and I just want to give you um, an introduction of who I am, my background, when Burning Man Hurts, and addressing trauma, which was spoken of earlier. And then speaking about Karen-esque camps. Uh, so this is my first year at Burning Man, and who would have known that I, in 2013, was going to become a centerfold of a world class photographer's book. Um, I was covering my face and waiting for him to request my permission and he never did so that's why I'm covered. I started that year um, with 12 camp members and we were three co-founders and then we grew to over 120. Um, in the midst of these last seven years, we have changed our name from Siberia to Polaris, and we are also a mutant vehicle. And that's one of the things that I will get to very quickly. Um, Burning Man hurt me when I spent a summer driving across the border to Mexico to get materials for this art car and I was the owner of the art car, and I presented myself to the DMV, and they went to the white uh, male members of our camp. And I was sitting back there wondering, wow, they're announcing that our car is approved to them, but I'm the owner. And I'm wondering, is this a racial thing? Is this a gender thing? And I don't know. So of course I wrote Burning Man, the DMV, and you guys required us to have driver's licenses the next year. and the next year with driver's license in hand and my name on the paper i'm still being asked are you the owner i'm not really sure if that's protocol or not i don't really take a heavy weight of that but um it was something that hurt and another thing that hurts in the media when i see burning man generalize the black population um and say they don't come to burning man because they don't like camping there's a spectrum of African Americans, black people, uh, anyone of every race, there's a spectrum. And if you haven't actually talked to someone who's not coming, then um, I think it's okay to not answer the media's silly question. I think it's okay to not answer that question and indicate that you're doing research to find out rather than generalizing. Um, when I came to Burning Man and I was informed that I was a burner, I was super happy to be part of the burner community. And then suddenly, I believe, not suddenly, but later down the line, there was a burner terminology that started to come about. And I felt that somehow I had been ripped from the community, the tribe that I was part of. So it's just a thing, I'll get over it, but I felt like Burning Man was my, my people. And the separation and the narration of the Black Burner stories over and over again, feels like the same kind of separation that we have in our society today. And I really just want to be a burner. End of story. I'm dusty, you're dusty. Um, I'm worried about Burning Man patronizing groups by race, um, going out of your personal principles um, to make a certain group feel good. I've, I've wondered, is this commodification on the Facebook post that Burning Man is doing maybe because this person is a person of color? That has concerned me. And I think it's important, as it's already been brought up, to understand that there are individuals who have not evolved and they aren't necessarily representative of Burning Man. 
And so there are negative, heavy negative individual behaviors. And sometimes I think those things get merged somehow. And I think that Burning Man should control its narrative um, a lot better rather than allowing the, indi the negative individual behaviors that are happening and they're, they're not related to the event in the way that they're part of or their employees, what have you, but they are just foul players in here. Um, I think it's important to address personal white shame, white guilt, victimization on anyone's parts, especially um, as you work to improve, because I think that shame, white shame or white guilt um, would negatively impact um, Burning Man. And finally, Karen S. camps. There are camps that are out there that are putting other camps down, such as my camp. Um, I will be very explicit and say that there was a camp, Barbie death camp, put down my camp. They never contacted us. They never reached out to us when we tried to understand what was wrong. And, um, and that kind of behavior, and rather than being connected um, like a family, we're just gonna call you out on X, Y, D thing without even having a conversation, I think is pretty foul in my experience. Um, still open to talking to anyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Safira. Uh, now we have Ramiro. I've been fortunate to not have any of these experiences happen. Um, actually, when I first joined the community, um, everyone was really, really friendly. They didn't really see color. Um, I don't know if that's like a regional thing. San Diego is a little bit different, definitely more diverse. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Uh, can, can, can. You're doing fine. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> So I've never had these issues. I, I, I'm sorry that that does happen, but I do have ideas for maybe making it more inclusive or diverse. Um, one thing that was done for me was I had someone show up to our college and try to recruit people to make more art projects, things like that. Um, it just so happened that my group was very diverse at school and um, yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is we could reach out to more diverse groups and try to include them by just giving them the opportunity to make really cool art. Great. Is that, is that, yeah, that's, that was it. That's it for me. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. You know, the, the, one thing just to mention is we're not here to necessarily say we all have to agree, you know, and all experience the same things. We're really here to listen to each individual's experience. And if you do have ideas or thoughts about what we should do and try, um, I just want to highlight, uh, please email diversity at burningman.org. You know, there's people behind that, including myself, including folks that you, we've introduced earlier who will follow up with you. And uh, we're definitely open to hearing all those ideas. So. Um, you don't have to share them all today if that's not coming to you right now. So thank you, Romero. Thank you. And next in the queue, we're going to hear from Tina, AKA Lantern Girl. I'm Lantern Girl Tina Liu. This was my ace burn. I was born in Taiwan, a citizen of the US, in Black Rock City, and I have lived and considered three regions of the world as my home. The radical and exclusionary regional incident I experienced after my virgin burn in one of my home regions where I was living at the time motivated me to repatriate back stateside my second burn to understand how something so wonderful can go so wrong. Since then, I've dedicated more than full time the last seven years of my life exclusively to contributing to diversity on Playa and beyond with the work of the artist collective I founded called Chinese Beyond Borders. I'm leaving out some detail of my story overview because I am choosing not to mention the names of those involved, but I am also comfortable providing their names if asked. The discrimination and radical exclusion I experienced was six years ago after my uh, my virgin burn, was from the RC of the two regions I was living at the time. My second burn that next year, I attempted to enlarge the very small community there at the time by creating a theme camp for the folks there, submitting two art 
pieces for honoraria and organize an exhibition on burner art and culture in the city where I was. More, decommod more decommodified than no spectators, the exhibition was to raise a general awareness of our beautiful community so there would be a better understanding of our efforts. But instead of receiving basic guidance and support from the RC, and I mean minimal, as in a five minute verbal warning or a simple link shared of the policies and procedures of the org in terms of intellectual property, the RC sabotaged our efforts by reporting a month before its opening to the org that we did not have permission to host the exhibition when the RC could have easily prevented the innocent offense. The RC then banned me from the Facebook groups I helped the RC create. The first 600 members were my friends I added to the two groups, severing our outreach, outreach to encourage the communal effort needed to realize those projects for the playa and locally. The RC literally broke five of the 10 principles to what I understood as politically motivated, his personal, the org's structural, and regional, uh, which was not his native, to suppress our efforts. The 15 virgins I brought to our camp's debut burn ended, ended up being adopted by another camp, and only our wearable art made it to Playa. And despite the ban, one of the two still ongoing, now after seven years, our work continued, gained recognition worldwide through the over 100 Facebook groups that I am now in and share without exclusion. The case was known by the regional management in direct communication with me at the very start and reminded in person every year and through a GLC submission that I made a few years later on the topic, but all the same, swept under that dusty crusted carpet. I have told my story to every person who has been willing to listen, which includes other org staff and volunteers sympathetic to our mission, but no one seemed to be willing to help mediate. The one advice from a regional management staff was for me to file a formal grievance. I have not done so because I have spent every waking moment these seven years to put our positive work above all else, to spread joy, earn a solid reputation, and then someone might really listen. So thank you for holding space for me today and perhaps one day a person of relevant responsibility will come and ask me what happened and how can we help to set things right. Thank you everyone. Thank you Tina. Next we're going to hear from John Paul aka Pocket Daddy. Hey everyone, um, I'm Jean-Paul in the default world I'm on the playa. I am Pocket Daddy. Um, I, uh, firstly, I'm very grateful. Thank you, Molly Rose. I was really excited when I got your email um, invited to speak. Uh, September of 2019 was my first year at Burning Man. And so what I'm going to talk about today is my experience um, around my camp, Kebiba. Um, which organized the Black Lives Matter March on the Playa, which I understand is the first um, political um, demonstration to take place on the Playa. Um, I've included some links in the chat um, to our Facebook um, and to some uh, content, um, if anybody wants to follow up or just kind of um, get an update on, on what happened. So, um, Kevira is a camp that was founded by um, queer women and women of color. So, as a queer person of color, it was very much home for me. Um, one of the leaders, uh, she's an artist based in Oakland called Fabiana Rodriguez. She had been campaigning to um, the board of directors and the leaders of Burning Man to commit um, to agree that um, radical inclusion also meant racial inclusion. Um, there's some stats that say 4% um, of burners are people of color, 1% um, of burners are black people. And so um, being a newbie, um, I kind of jumped into this um, massive dialogue that I feel was already happening and so that I was very fortunate to witness. Um, Fabiana was in conversation with um, the CEO of Burning Man, Marion Goodall, um, and I think some of the board, board members. And um, we were gonna hold the march and asked um, them to meet us. We were gonna gift them um, kind of our ideas about how radical inclusion means racial inclusion. Uh, and so we leave our tent, we have this big truck with a Black Lives Matter march sign, 
Um, hella people turned out, like people that were just walking by were like, what are you doing? We're like marching for Black Lives Matter, join us. And so that part was really beautiful um, as uh, being a person of color myself to see kind of that allyship um, on the playa to me was was just amazing. It made me wonder if, if something like that was, was possible in the default world. Um, but that's also when things kind of got a little bit ugly for me. Um, I was just watching around um, and I could see different camps where people were not moving, where people were kind of standing behind their picket or their line or their fence. And I have been a victim of homophobia and racism my entire life. I know when someone's talking smack about me, when someone's not happy. And it was just these faces of like, discontent and, and disgust that, that we were doing this. And I think now in retrospect, now that I've had seen the comments, um, I think a lot of people are not happy that there was a political discussion brought to the playa. But I think that's an interesting concept because as people of color, like our lives are highly political. We have to fight for our rights 24 seven. So I thought that was an interesting kind of departure from what I thought the playa was supposed to be about. Um, and so we get to the section where the board members are supposed to be, I am timing, oh wow, okay. Um, yeah, I included the links. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Pocket Daddy. You have about 10 more seconds if you wanna give a wrap up sentence. Yeah, um, I just would love to see um, kind of the leaders engage and commit to radical inclusion, meaning racial inclusion. Um, I think that there's opportunities there to bring POC and the people who are most affected into the fold. Um, I have plenty of ideas, as I'm sure we all do, so um, I'll be sure to follow up. But thank you again for this opportunity and um, lovely to see Verner's. Thank you, Jean-Paul. Next in the queue, we have Ariposa. Hello, everybody. And like uh, you say, Playa provides. This is perfect. Uh, Pocket Daddy just like set it up perfectly for me. I was part of the uh, uh, March for Radical Inclusion. Uh, first time going to Burning Man, Virgin. It was amazing. Catharsis uh, introduced me to this amazing culture. But it was also very uh, eye-opening for me. Um, you know all this uh, feeling just kind of like drowning in a sea of like white faces and seeing all the you know like the amount of people that were like really people of color and just to just basically reading the 10 principles you know diversity cannot exist without inclusion and like uh, pocket daddy said it was a lot of people that were definitely not for it they were not for inclusion so one thing that I really learned uh, with my experience there at Playa was that, you know, we have to hold uh, space for ourselves first and then we can hold space for others. So, you know, we belong there. So we stay there. I don't care the faces. I don't care the experiences. I, I had a, a very bad experience as well with Burning Man staff and they were being very racist to me and a couple of my friends, of course, other blacks and people of color as well, which I share in one of the um, panels with uh, the CEO and the board as well there and just what we want is change and if it's so much opportunity and space for white people why are the numbers so uneven right so um, I also do uh, what I part I sorry, participate with Catharsis and um, I do I have an um, I'm part of an organization called the de los Muertos and we um, use altars to heal you know with uh, through grief and it was amazing to associate the temple with those altars and see everybody coming together and get connected through it so you know we all are going to experience death we're never we're not gonna it's none of us that is gonna skip that so if we all are the same like why are we making that exclusion even at playa so one of the things again that i learned there and that it made me stronger and i was just like at the beginning feeling shy and i appreciate my 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 friends my brothers and my sisters there um ursula nexus eeyore roman lauren like secretito curvy i can say like so many names that really like build that circle of love that made me 
realize that I belong. And then we have to pass that torch and we have to keep bringing our people in. And thank you so much for uh, Que Viva Camp for, for planning that amazing march. And also for the Black Burner Project, a shout out to Erin Douglas, like amazing and great connection. So I'm sorry that I was just like rambling super fast, but um, I'm not gonna give up. And we have to eradicate that um, all that horrible feelings and vice with love and strength and just, you know, hold your space, be strong, you belong. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you for that, Adi. Next in the queue is Lion. Oh, can you guys hear me okay? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Yeah, just was saying I wanted to share a little bit about my experience because uh, it was really positive and I want to figure out how we can have other people have a similar experience to the one that I did. So um, about how I got to the burn in the first place, um, I was born in Hawaii and I grew up in Minnesota, just, just like everyone. Um, and I remember hearing about the burn when I was a teenager and thinking, A, that this seemed like one of the coolest things that I could ever think of to try and survive in the desert for a week. And B, that it was never going to actually happen because how was I going to get everything that I needed to survive in the desert out there? I don't know. I'm a teenager. Uh, my mom's said that she was watching as well. Uh, she has told me a direct quote that she doesn't like to be outside in places where there are more than five trees and know that there are not a lot of trees on the playa, but I promise you 100 degrees and dusty is not what she meant as an alternative. So I started to think that I could go to the event when I moved here to San Francisco and I met other burners, realized that they were just people. Uh, I was going to say normal people, but we all know that you're not really that normal, but that's okay. That's what I like about you. Uh, and so my right time was my third year in San Francisco. I had a big year. Uh, I left my nonprofit job to work in tech. Uh, I became a yoga instructor. Uh, I moved into a hippie commune and I won the Burning Man ticket lottery. So I was really excited to go. Um, and after that, uh, I was able to do things that were honestly beyond my wildest dreams. And I was really lucky because I lived here in San Francisco. I had a really strong community. I had a friend from college who introduced me to their camp lead, who I had actually met a couple of months ago at this bootleg late night in Japantown. He was happy to invite us to join his camp. Uh, they let us build. We got to go over to Moxie and Fruitvale. Shout out to Moxie. Um, I did meal prep for uh, a meal for our 100 person camp, um, and I got to go early and help build. Um, all of that was amazing. In fact, my very first night on the playa, I got to stay up all night and uh, help our sisters camp Pele's fire uh, do some building. I got to hear a wonderful story about how they apparently started as a camp called Tetrahedron that was uh, funded by the guy who invented Tetris. Um, so after the first year, um, I asked if I could be a co-lead of the camp and they let me do, uh, they let me be one, which was amazing. Uh, I have so many good stories that I could tell uh, from the playa that there's obviously not time for all of them, but my favorite one was last year. Uh, one of my very favorite DJs named Minnesota after my home state. Uh, his bike broke down outside of our camp and we helped him fix it. And then he came back later that night and offered to take us on an adventure and we followed him and it was really amazing. So uh, they, this type of empowerment, being able to go to this event and be in a place where people don't care. For me, all of, I've experienced is people care about Am I interested to work as well as play? And do I treat the event and the people at the event well? And as long as I can do those two things, uh, I keep getting allowed to do things. And that really helps build confidence. Uh, ha doing that helped me have the confidence to quit my job last fall and take a coding boot camp. And uh, it's just really been a wonderful experience for me. So I think that it, uh, events like this, where we have an opportunity for people of color to see other people of color and hear their stories is really important. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to Erin from the Black Burner Project because uh, this is the exact type of thing that uh, she does and that we're working at to let everyone know that we do belong here and we are welcome here. So more events like this, more connecting of the community. I know camps out there that want campers and especially campers of color in there and more acculturation. So there are people out there who want to go to the burn, but it seems like a really daunting task to them. So how do we give the, empower those people who want to come join us to actually do that? And thank you so much for letting me talk. Nice to meet y'all. Um, next in the queue is Kiana and then is Little Bird and Moonshine. So if you guys could just get prepped. Kiana, if you want to unmute yourself, we're ready to hear you. 
Hi, <laughs> I'm Kiana. Um, I'm super excited to be picked to share my story today. Um, uh, Burning Man has also been very transformative to my life. And um, I have gone, I started my, my journey with um, self-development when I became to my uh, when I became exposed to my Burning Man community before ever reaching Burning Man, um, which was maybe a, a year later. So um, I've only been two years, um, 2018 and 2019. I've never had any experiences with not feeling included or um, racism. Um, uh, but uh, you know, I love Burning Man because I feel so included. That is the place. That is the one place on earth where I feel the most included, which is great. Um, but uh, the, you know, the lack of diversity reminds me of um, my experience growing up in a small town um, with a handful of black people and um, I'm half black. So it, it reminds me of uh, growing up in, in a small town that lacks diversity majorly. Um, not really bothered by it, but uh, you know, because of that, I, I find myself counting when I do see black people when I know there are very few wherever I am, no matter where I am in the world, um, I do find myself counting. And I found myself doing that at Burning Man. Whenever I saw a black person in my mind, I would make a mental note and I'd be like, oh, there's one, you know. Um, so, you know, that's something that that I would love to change because that that's you know, that's kind of uncool. <laughs> um, anyway, an experience that um, I was completely blown away by. Um, so many people have already mentioned um, the Black Burner Project. I didn't know that that's what that was, but uh, last year, uh, a fellow Black Burner, there was only two of us in my whole camp, uh, the Fluffer Camp, and uh, he came to me and he said, hey, Kiana, there's this thing going on. And uh, it's happening on Saturday, I think at six o'clock or something by the man, all the black people, you know, by word of mouth are getting together and we're going to take a big photo. Um, so, you know, lots of crazy things happened. I think I heard about that on a Monday or Tuesday. Lots of crazy things happened during that week, including losing my phone and really not knowing what time it was. But um, I was so committed to making uh, this and I wanted to see what it was about. And I shared uh, with other burner friends, you know, what was happening and they, you know, wanted to tag along and, and check it out also. And um, it was just amazing because by word of mouth, about 300 uh, people of black descent gathered under the van. And I had never seen that many black people at Burning Man, which blew my mind. And it made me feel even more at home and it made me feel excited to, to um, share that experience outside of the playa to let my black community know that like, hey, look, you know, like you can be included too. Like there's this many black people that come to Burning Man and um, a lot of black people that I associate with or that I know or that my family you know, uh, or whoever my family is outside of Burning Man they're not interested. They think it's really just something white people do, you know, and they think it's crazy. Um, so I couldn't be more thankful for the organizers that organized this and bring us together, take the photo, which I posted all over social media afterwards and had people reaching out to me, you know, asking me more about it. So I think more events like this, you know, more people stepping up, um, to create uh, occasions like this, to create conversations that happen on and off the playa to make, you know, to make Burning Man more diverse and inclusive would be wonderful. Thank you, Kiana. Um, I know folks have been referring to Black Burner Project, so if someone wants to send out a link so that people know what that is, that would be great. Um, next up is Little Bird and then Moonshine. Little Bird, please unmute yourself. Um, can you guys hear me? Yep, sound great. Okay, awesome. Um, hi, my name is Little Bird. Um, I want to thank you guys for allowing me to be a part of this. This is awesome. Um, my first time going to Burning Man was in 2018. I went to Burning Man because I saw an episode of Malcolm in the Middle. <laughs> and um, I, ever since I was a kid, I've wanted to go. And so I had an opportunity to go in 2018. 
And I'll be honest, I, I'm sad that there's so many Black people that have had terrible experience or bad experiences for one day uh, because it was one of the few places where I didn't feel burdened by my Blackness. You know, one of the things that sucks about being um, of African descent is that oftentimes we are having to put up this guard and be flawless because when our vulnerabilities are put out there, um, what tends to happen is they get to be used against us. And so I went renegade style. I, I was not planning on being knowing anybody. I wasn't planning on making like a bunch of friends that were going to be long term. And I didn't care what anybody thought about me. So I went and for the first time ever, the only thing people could talk about was, oh, have you been to the, you know, the, the, the trampolines or have you been to the ball uh, pit in the, the bus? You know, things like that. No one was concerned about like who we were outside of this world that we all created. Um, and so I, I wish that more black people could experience or people of color in general could experience this place because it's one of those few places where you can explore different sides of yourself where you can be vulnerable where you could be flawed and be able to um get to know yourself outside of this box that society puts you in um if i could make some suggestions i went to this tent where we had a conversation it was called the sex cult and the host was referring to rejection and how like it's easy to ask for consent as long as you kind of get away from that idea of rejection i think that it would be nice to have those kind of conversations in regards to like um like race and and color and and maybe these labels that we put on ourselves um because it would allow for us to kind of like get to the core of the issue instead of us like being on the edge and being afraid of what people are going to say um because one thing that I would like for you guys all to know is that people of color are not homogenous. So we have, we're coming into this conversation with different backgrounds, different ideas, um, and people who are non people of color are not homogenous. Um, so it would be nice for us to all have like a, a real vulnerable conversation where we're not, um, where we can be racist if we want to, or bias or prejudice or whatever we may feel, we can feel that so we can get into like the core of like why it is that we feel these things towards each other but i loved it um only time my blackness ever came a, like into a conversation was uh sometimes like guys from europe would say i've never kissed the black girl before as like a way to hit on me <laughs> um and i was like you know what i'm gonna give you that go ahead you give me a kiss um but other than that it was it was never anything where i felt like I was experiencing racism. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, little bird. <laughs> I'm going to call on Moonshine next. Moonshine and then David. After. Fantastic. How's everyone going, uh, doing? I hope everyone is well. Uh, thanks uh, to the Burning Man Org for putting this together to talk about uh, diversity and uh, inclusion. Uh, my name is Moonshine uh, Charles. I've been to the burn uh, nine years. Uh, eight in a row before I had a little little dip in 2018. Um, was so happy to come back 2019. Uh, so uh, first of all, I'd like to, to acknowledge Safira and, and Little Bird. Uh, you touched on something that is really the point of what I want to talk about, and that is a spectrum. Um, uh, black folks, uh, like every other human on the planet, uh, we, we exist on a, on a spectrum. Um, uh, I know this country has done a very good job of sort of programming into the minds of, of white America that uh, black folks sort of belong in, in one or maybe a couple. This is, this is 2020, so I think there's maybe two or three that, that uh, sort of labels that, that black folks have, but um, it is a, a vast and varied spectrum. Uh, I think if uh, white America can accept that more uh, when uh, approaching a black person and instead of sort of having this idea uh, in their mind of who that person is as a, as a black person, um, the, the experience can be a, a lot different for everyone involved. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up um, is a systemic oppression and, and what that has done to black Americans 
uh, in this country. Um, and one of the things that it has done is it's, it's prevented uh, black folks from having a lot of the same opportunities uh, that um, our, our white counterparts have. So uh, it is, uh, I cannot stress how, how difficult it is for um, a black person to get onto Playa. Uh, it's huge, especially if you, you don't live in this, uh, on the West Coast or somewhere in that area. It's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, so as I think about the future of, of, of Burning Man, I, I think about how the Burning Man org can, can help repair that. And you know, you'll hear the word reparations come up as we talk, you know, talk about you know, changing things in the country. And I think uh, uh, Burning Man and, and the organization can sort of jump ahead and think about how it can proactively uh, reach out to black communities ac across uh, America, and even outside the country for that matter, and provide uh, opportunities uh, to, to get uh, black folks uh, on the playa. I think it's, uh, it's it, 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 I think it's great for any person, uh, for sure. Uh, but, but I think there's, there are some proactive steps that have to be taken in order to make sure that uh, there's that inclusion really actually happens as opposed to just having these sort of diversity and inclusion uh, talks and discussions. And, and so I hope that in the future, uh, we all work together on figuring out how we can reach out to those underserved communities uh, so that they can uh, get out on the playa um, and have the experiences that I have. And, I, and I'll spend this last 20 seconds saying I've had some amazing experiences, um, but uh, like America, it's, it's varied. You know, I have, moments of great elation, and I have also moments of great frustration. Uh, oh, I have 30 seconds, okay. Um, uh, moments of great frus frustration. Uh, I think everyone, regardless of their race, uh, has that, that type of experience. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm, I'm ha uh, again, I'm, I'm grateful for, to have this platform and uh, hope that in the future we can see some, some great change. Thank you, Moonshine. I'm gonna just keep going in the queue. So the next folks that we have are David and Janos, or Janos, you guys are up next. Hi, David here. Um, sorry, nervous. But I wanna second what everybody's saying, really Burning Man has been like a transformative experience and I, I couldn't be happier that I have discovered it. My first time at Burning Man, um, was in 2015 and I have been, you know, since and also to a lot of, um, um, regional ones, and uh, and I want to share this like story because I think this story might be able to encapsulate a lot of how I feel. Um, so I normally go to Burning Man with this camp of like, you know, queer people from San Francisco, but most of them are like white, obviously, and um, like I love them a lot, I guess in a way, and we're like old friends, but I never really like you know you never feel feel like. Like you're there, it feels more like it's a white space that's making that's you know giving you a room with them, and it's not like a space where, like you never feel fully fully included with them. So, um, but I still you know go with them every year because I love them. And uh, um, I you know normally I guess Wednesday night is like acid night. We all drop acid, hang around the playa, whatever. I I know people don't like doing drugs at Burning Man, but you know you have to sometimes. And um, and then one time like two years ago, uh, two or three years ago, we were. Uh, the acid night, lots of, um, I, I don't know, like we all went together, but I, I felt, I felt like very, very, very lonely. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I like, I don't like these people. I don't like what I'm doing. I don't like what's happening. I, I spent the whole night like alone, wandering around the playa, jumping from our car to another, like kind of like just unhappy, like, 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 you know, that, that deep unhappiness that you feel on acid that is like stronger than the regular unhappiness that we feel every day. And, and I felt like, like, I don't even know why I'm here and Burning Man, like I'm at the most inclusive place in the world, but I'm, I don't feel included. Like what, like it was very, very like odd and it, and it lasted like several hours. And then I was wandering around the playa and I saw this art card that I was told that I was managed by a Colombian crew. Uh, I'm an immigrant from Colombia, I guess. I forgot that's an important part of the story. Um, and then I, I, I heard that this car was manned by Colombian people. So I was like, oh, it sounds like super cool. I'm going to talk to this group of Colombian people. And then what they meant by the car being a car by Colombian people means that some like super rich dude from San Francisco paid a bunch of like engineers and builders and, and, and whatever from Colombia to come to the playa to 
to uh, what's it called to operate the car during the week. And I met I met these six people that work on the car. None of them spoke English. None of them knew what the fuck Burning Man was. They were just like you know paid to go to some place to like put together an art car and operate it for a week. And and I spent like a couple hours with them, and it's probably the, the happiest hours that I spent at Burning Man. And and what and I don't know you know like. It, to me, it was very weird. Like, why is it that I am here? And um, why is it that the most connected I've ever feel at Burning Man is when I meet this group of like, basically like laborers that were imported from a different country to participate at the event. And it made me think a lot about how a lot of people that go to Burning Man care about inclusion, but they don't spend any second thinking about um, like class inclusion. And how a lot of my candidates from my San Francisco candidates just kind of like, you know, they're like, oh, it's a Latino guy. Let's put him on the kitchen. Let's like have him clean. Let's do this. Let's do that. And like, there's a lot of things that like, you know, humans are, you know, it's not that they're mean or whatever. It's just that that's how they live their lives. And nobody, you know, a lot of people don't stop the thing. Like, how are my actions affecting other people and whatnot? And yeah, sorry. But I think like the story um, just kind of like summarized a lot of that. I think like there's a lot more that we can do to make sure that like people of lower income and immigrants feel a lot more welcome at the camp at Burning Man. Thank you, David. Um, next up is Janos or Janos. And I messaged everyone that we are going to attempt to have an open mic if anyone feels inspired and is not scheduled to speak, contact Molly Rose or myself directly. Um, but Janos or Janos, yeah. please. I'm, I'm here. There you go. Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Janos. He and his. Uh, really great to be here. I feel like I miss all of you, even though I don't know any of you. Uh, this has been really nice to listen to. Also, this is my work background, but it's also my costume closet. So I'm going to open it just for this group. Uh, so unlike most of my Zooms, I'm going to be able to show off what I have. Um, so. I love Burning Man. I've been a few times. I try to participate in local burner activities here in New York City. And, uh, you know, the first time I went, I have to admit, I was like one of, I was one of those skeptics within the friend group um, before going for my first time. And the first couple days did feel a sense of, you know, is it appropriate for people to call this a celebration of inclusion and freedom uh, when there are so few people of color and so few low income people here? And, you know, by about day four, I was just having such a good time. I kind of let that thread go and just embraced what Burning Man was and had an amazing week. My second time I went was the summer after Black Lives Matter had first really started. And again, uh, I had seen people react a little bit uh, contentiously to those who were, you know, putting Black Lives Matter signs up and things like that, saying, hey, this is not for politics. And... You know, again, there, I never saw anyone behave in a way that was racist. Nobody ever treated me in a way that was racist. And, but again, I sort of eventually let things go. I was having such a good time. And then, you know, one year I decided to go to Azora in Hungary, which is a, um, that's where the white side of my family's from. I'm half Indian, half Hungarian. And uh, Azora is this uh, festival in the forest of Hungary, very similar to Burner Values in some ways, although water is available, which is nice. Uh, and... Hungary had fallen into this sort of quasi-fascist government that it still has now. And when I would speak to people, they talked about how this is an escape. This is the only place they can really go to be themselves. Because, you know, the government is so hostile to, to immigrants and to people of Roma uh, heritage in Hungary. And so that was weighing on me heading into my last time at Burning Man, which is 2017. And I tried to be more involved that year. I spoke at the Center Camp series about racial justice, which is the issue... Uh, that I work on professionally. And, uh, you know, like 20 people came. It was, it was whatever. It was not a particularly successful speech. Uh, and, but I was bothered by, in a way that had not been before, the fact that, you know, post-Trump election, this was a place of escapism for a lot of people and for a select group of people, right? It, there's, there's a lot of people who cannot escape to Burning Man who feel the brunt of what we're going through these past few years, immigrants, black people, um, you know, Muslim Americans, and it just made me frustrated in a way that, you know, we, that we would create environments all collectively, right? We all own this together, um, where, where it's escaping what the realities that we're facing, but acknowledging that only a select group of people can escape. So I don't know, my, my salute, I haven't been the last few years, so I, I don't know if that 
has been if I would feel the same way if I went in 2019. But, you know, I do wonder if there are ways to sort of allow um, the harsh realities of the outer world to come to the playa in order to lift up people um, and make them feel heard and protected. I don't know if the way that um, art installations can do a better job reaching out to certain communities to make their presence felt on the playa, um, their energy felt there. Uh, some people have suggested other really good ideas So, in the chat and before. So anyway, I want to be constructive. I love Burning Man, but I just want to lift up that, um, that feeling. So thank you. Thanks, Janos. We are just going to move right along to try to fit in as many speakers as possible. Next on the list, we have Chocolate, followed by Alicia St. Rose, but it looks like Chocolate might have fallen off the call. So want to give you a second. No, I'm here. Oh, great. Hi, uh, everybody. Uh, how much time do I have? Four minutes. Four minutes. All right. Well, um, it's really great to see everybody's faces. So many familiar faces. I love you all and I miss you so much. And it's so sad that we don't get to go out there this year. But um, uh, I have to say uh, BRC VR was pretty awesome. Whoever put all that together, that was freaking great. Um, my experience on Playa, like my first year, I won't even really count because I was just like mind blown. I didn't pay attention to any sort of racial stuff if that was going on. Um, but I didn't experience anything like that either. My second year, um, I got connected with a camp uh, that was mostly people from the South, from North Carolina and Texas. And they were all white, except for me, who's from the Bay Area. And I'm used to being like the only black guy anyway. So like my, my racism radar is like off kilter, I think, from a lot of other people's racism radar. Because I just, I don't know, I'm half black, half white. So I see things differently on that level too. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of mixed races here, but you know, I tend to err on the side of forgiving slight racism, I guess, or bigotry, people who don't know they're being racist, maybe. Um, and I can navigate through that really well through life. I always have been able to. So on Playa, it's like that too. I, I navigate through any of that kind of stuff. Um, Anyway, so I was with this camp. I've been with them for, let's see, I camped with them for about 13 years. My first year was 2002. And just, it has just been lovely. Um, everybody's, like I said, from the South, they have, ac you know, South, Southern accents and everything. And, and uh, I had a chance to go back to Transformers uh, a few years ago, I think the last Transformers. And I was blown away by the racism of the South. I didn't never experienced anything like that. But all these people that I've camped with all these years were from there. And to see the environment that they were used to, all these white people and the black people all segregated and all that stuff, and that not to translate to the playa, that made a big impact, especially after all those years with those people. Um, anyway, that's the camp side of things, uh, or that part of the camp. Um, I'm also, uh, got to a point where I got tired of partying all the time and I thought, oh, I'll be a ranger because I had a lot of friends who were rangers and I was helping people all the time anyways, because I'd had a bunch of years of experience and people asked me stuff. So I joined the rangers and I had great experiences there. No racism that I could tell and, uh, was included in leadership opportunities and, um, leadership uh yeah leadership stuff with the rangers and that was really great that felt very special um i also am part of gate and i did that one year i'm like oh, i'm tired of the rangers let's go to gate and the rangers like no you can't leave and gates like come to us so i went with gate for a while and everybody is super cool no racial stuff whatsoever a lot of salty attitudes and maybe people tell you to fuck off and hate you but that's not it was not racial in any kind of way and you know, seeing the the Black Burner project pop up, I mean, I had one year, I think it was 2013. Uh, oh, I'm also a temple builder for many years, like six years or seven years or something like that. And to try to include as many people as color of color that come across my path throughout the year. People are always coming to me throughout the year. Aaron, how do we get to the playa? How do we, it's too expensive. I'm like, just go, just go to the playa. I'll help you. And I try to plug people into these things. Anyways, my experience has been great, and if there's anybody out there that's having a hard time plugging in, I'm connected to a lot of things. Reach out. I'm also on this special, uh, the community events team with Raspit and Justin, and I want to thank them for including me for all these years, too.
anyways, that's it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Next, we are going to hear from Alicia St. Rose. I, I want to uh, tell you guys that I am, um, my first year at Burning Man was 2003, and I've not missed one, and hashtag this burn counts 2020. Um, I am on the team of BRCBR, and I'm glad to be an honor to be on that team that brought that Burning Man. Um, I want to um, just, just tell a story that probably encapsulates my experience at Burning Man. And it's uh, 2017, which was my best year, because all I did was roam around on my bike and have meaningful conversations with everyone I met. Um, and I was in the Golden Cafe, where my friend Jay Bardman, uh, he tirelessly works the bar. And uh, he doesn't even know what Burning Man is like outside of that place. But I'm in there, I'm having a drink, and this beautiful, beautiful woman comes up to me. And she's richly chocolate brown and, and just gorgeous. And she looks at me and she says this really tentative, hi, hello. And I'm like, well, hi, you know, hi, how are you? And she goes, I'm fine. I just don't see a lot of people who look like me here, like you. And I looked at her and I said, honey, we don't look alike at all. You're like really dark, beautiful woman. And I'm like, I'm kind of copper and freckled. And I said to her, listen, you don't come to Burning Man to find people who look like you. You come here to find yourself. So I want you, my suggestion is you go out now and you go into the dust and you let it take you wherever it needs to take you because you're going to get your lessons from here. And and for me, for 18 years, I've gotten my lessons, I've gotten my magic, I've gotten my sustenance. My new year starts in September. I tell people I feel like I found real Hogwarts, you know, and I've never had a racial incident ever. I'm not looking for them. I, um, I, I, I am aligned with the idea that people are stupid <laughs> and that they say stupid stuff. That is not my problem. <laughs> And if I make it my problem, then they snuff out my burn. And I can't give them that. You cannot give that away. You can't give, I can't give people power by having what they do, which is stupid, affect me and make me not have a good time at a place that, A, took a lot of money and hard work to get there. <laughs> and I'm getting dusty. And I'm like, I need to have my fun. So, so yes. So, and also, there are very few places on this planet where you can go and leave your, I'm going to say, shit at the gate. And that shit would be everything society puts on you, tells you who you have to be. Your community that you apparently belong to, you can't listen to Beatles because it's weird. Or, or someone else looking at you and only seeing the color of your skin. At Burning Man, the insight is on the outside and no one cares. And there are very few places. Everybody deserves that opportunity to experience that, everyone. And so to be honest, I'm nervous about having this conversation where it feels like it's heading in the direction of parcelizing my Burning Man because we all own it. It's all ours. We make it. We found that out with, our, with BRCBR. Just add burners, you have Burning Man. <laughs> so you, bet, you can put them in a park and there's a burn. <laughs> and so I'm, to be honest, I'm nervous about it. And I, but I understand where people are coming from when their experiences are different or when they are, are exposed to a different environment. I, I actually, and that, that means I have 30 seconds, um, I actually burn everywhere I go. <laughs> so I don't actually have a lot of these experiences off Playa either. Um, I just choose not to let what someone else does to take away my power. And so um, these conversations are great and I really appreciate them, but I really want to retain the idea that it's the individual, the unique individual that's vastly important when you go to Burning Man and everyone needs to experience being seen as that deeply spiritual individual that they are. So thank you. Thank you. Want to dwell on it, but we're going to move on to, to leave space for as many voices as possible. Really appreciate everybody's bravery sharing today. Um, and next, we're going to watch a video from two people who couldn't be here today because of the time difference, but who asked um, very strongly that their video be aired during the live call. So our team member, Emma, is going to go ahead and share her screen and play this video. And while she's getting set up, I will tell you that Tape Master, 
one of the folks in the video, is based in London with Karma Love Camp. They are a tumble guardian and also a center camp cafe volunteer. And then Day K is based in uh, Alberta, Canada, camping with Morningwood back in 2012 at Fertility 2.0. So those are the folks whose video we're about to watch. It's not like I felt like, okay, people were racist or people had an issue with me or anything like that. It's more, um, you feel that you might be different. Not by everyone. They don't think that we might feel on, on the outskirts of things, that we might feel not part of whatever is going on. I'm not sure they are aware of how we might feel. I think if I felt more of the invitation, you know, even though I might be different and I might do things differently or I look different, um, feel like I am invited in or pulled in, if you will, as a, as a minority, I think that would have that would have made a difference. So in the end, I was kind of trying to figure out how I could fit in somehow, you know, and, and mirror some of the things that I would see um, to make them see that I'm not that different, you know, and I'm interested and I want to be part of it. But it was hard. It's hard work. It's hard. And, um, you know, it's, it's intimidating. Um, it's, uh, you just feel awkward, <laughs> you know? When it comes to equity or inclusion, that you have to recognize that this world, like whether you're on the BRC, you're in the BRC or in the default world, that this, we live in a white supremacy. Like you said, there are different needs for different hair textures. Um, and that's never on any of the documentation that's offered on the website. Um, that would be radical inclusion to say not everybody has the same hair. Decentering whiteness is part of, of inclusion, like mm -hmm. recognizing that we're not all able-bodied, we're not all neurotypical, that we're not all uh, the dominant culture uh, or the dominant race. Having cultural humility Mm -hmm. is this is term that is, uh, was coined by Melanie Turvalon and William Murray Garcia out of California. They were in the healthcare industry. It's a relationship of mm -hmm. always learning about another person, another culture, um, and having that humility to recognize you'll never be an expert in somebody else's culture. Sure. That's not your own. Because I don't think that the exclusion is intentional and actually radical inclusion is about including people. So the intention is there, but I guess it's how it manifests and concretely, practically, yes. Yeah. Embracing difference, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Instead of, yeah, saying, I don't see color. <laughs> what? The question is about the awareness, attention, intention, um, active inclusion and impact i think we need more more spokespeople you know to spread the word about it because then I, I think that's the only way we can get representation because like i said in the very beginning i i didn't feel welcome or i had to give myself permission to go i had to hear about it and then actually make that step and feel invited and and i think i needed more i need you you showed me the way by way of example you know like you uh told me about it. And if it wasn't for you, it would have been more difficult to go. So I don't know what you think, but I think that's what we need, you know, just more spokespeople, more visibility, so that we well, get more representation, so that we get less tokenized. Many of my friends, my BIPOC friends, would never consider going to Burning Man because it doesn't feel like a safe space. Like, and I don't believe in safe spaces because you can only have accountable spaces where people are aware of what other people's needs are and and are responsible for what impacts they may cause my concern about just thinking about inclusion is what are you including them into like mm -hmm. are people prepared to have that many many bipoc people in the space most resistance towards equitable change in any corporation nonprofits, is about giving up power mm -hmm. And, and power on the playa, I don't know what that means, but it's about <laughs> um, being able to wear dreadlocks without anybody questioning them, um, being able to wear a headdress if they do, being able to practice other people's yeah. rituals, without, rituals having, yes. yeah, without having anybody say, hey, um, you can't do that. The inner work of awareness isn't built into a space before people arrive of difference 
of mm-hmm. equity seeking communities, then you're putting them in a place of, of conflict or of danger, even mm-hmm. like where they might be more exposed. Right, to, right, right. Because uh, it wouldn't uh, be not, it wouldn't be organic. It would be sort of forced, into, smashed. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. needs to be an organic change. Uh, BIPOC people should be paid for this type of labor. <laughs> All right, fine. Well then, yeah. And this is a great start, and I'm looking forward to. Yeah, uh, let's see what happens. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. First right. steps. Thank you for sharing that, Emma, and thank you to Julie and Jackie, even though they're not here with us live on the call. Uh, next, we are going to hear from Taya, followed by Nexus. Hi. I have to say, it's giving me a great deal of joy to see uh, the melange of people who are on this call. Because I have been going to Burning Man since uh, 1998. So half my life, I have been, I would say, a burner. And the first year that I went, I saw one other person of color. And I didn't let that stop me because my curiosity is what drove me to Burning Man in the first place. But I decided I would do one thing. By making my presence known, by being here, by being involved and being engaged, I hope that someone would see a cocoa brown girl like me and think, hey, there might be a place for me at this event. So I became part of the leadership structure. I became a regional contact in 2004. And for a very long time, I was the only African-American regional contact. And then, uh, you know, maybe about 10 years later, there were, there were other people of color who were participating in leadership. And that gave me a great deal of joy because you want to feel that your presence will make a difference to someone. Someone will see you and not be fearful and want to be curious and come along on the journey. I mean, I'm going to be a burner till the day I die. My heart is welded to this community. Um, I, I feel such joy whenever I communicate and engage with burners because we have an unspoken language that we speak. We can look at each other. We know right off the bat our connection is solid because of, we share Black Rock City. We share the dream of Black Rock City. We share the hard labor of making it happen. And we, we share this wild creative spirit that will let us go out to the middle of nowhere and create a space where we can try to make our dreams come true, so to speak. Now, I, I know as a person attending a color, I have had maybe, I've had one experience where I would say that it was rather jarring for me um, as a person of color to actually see and and i don't it wasn't intentional i think it was more of a matter of ignorance as to why this camp named themselves this particular name but you know very often we'll arrive midweek on the playa you might arrive at night you pull into your camp with your friends who've been there for a while you set up you go to sleep you wake up well this particular year for me i happen to wake up that next morning after pulling into camp at night and the camp next to us had a name that was just a derogatory name for black people. That was the name of their camp. And I was immediately got a sick feeling in the pit of my pit of my stomach. Because I thought, why would they do this? Why would they soil my home, my Black Rock City with this name? And I I couldn't understand it. So I actually talked to one of my camp mates and said, hey, I need to let you know that the name of that camp is a really bad name that they used to use for black people. And my my camp mate at the time, she says, oh, you know, if you can if you can not talk to them about that right now, if you can maybe talk to them about it later, because they've been really cool and, you know, I don't want any weird friction to happen. So, you know, very often it's put upon the person of color to control their behavior, to not do certain things, to don't make waves. And at that particular year, I was immobile. I had an injury. I couldn't move the way I would normally move. So I couldn't even up and move from the camp. So I had to find a way to deal with this that was basically happening in my own backyard. So I did talk with them about it. And I'd mentioned that maybe perhaps they might want to consider um, a different name for their camp and then kind of 
gave them some indication as to why this was a negative name and, and really shouldn't be used on the playa. And what I would recommend for in the future is if we could create systems by which we could educate people when they name their camps, let them know what names might not be suitable to name their camp, not in a way of censorship, but in a way of education. So they can choose names that are maybe more inclusive and wouldn't be offensive to other people. Thank you so much for that, Taya. Um, next, we're going to move to the following in the queue, which is Nexus. And then just a heads up that a rooster will be coming after that in our last confirmed speaker section. So go ahead, Nexus. Awesome. Thank you so much, Molly. Hey, everyone. My name is Nexus. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I'm here in the traditional and occupied territory of the Pamunkey and the Piscataway, which a lot of us call Washington, D.C. I'm a cis, queer, Black, and Filipino-American person who's ethically non-monogamous. Uh, just sharing all that because even though we're only talking about one thing, I am all those things and more. Um, and I'm also a regional contact here in D.C., as well as a member of the Purple Circle with Comfort and Joy. So my first burn was in 2013, and while... <laughs> My memory is fuzzy for a lot of reasons, including age. Um, if I were to remember anything that kind of surprised me about it, it, it would have been the following. And it was something that I didn't realize how how different Burning Man would be until I realized that like, I'd be walking to the porta potty in the morning and I'd hear someone say hello. And I think I, 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 I was like, oh, that's, people are so friendly here. And then I'd be walking somewhere else and I'd, I'd hear someone else say hi again and I'd, I'd see they were kind of looking my direction. I was like, I, I don't know them. Why would they be saying hi to me, right? And finally, I realized that's exactly what was happening. And in the span of like not even a week, the first couple of days, I think I'd said hi to more people on my block than I do in my neighborhood back home. And I didn't realize how surprising this was until I was like, wow, there are a lot of white people saying hi to me. And I get to say hi back because in, in the world outside of Black Rock City, um, I, I have to do my best for my own mental and physical health to, to make white people I don't know feel safe, even when walking on the sidewalk. I was having a conversation with a client, I do anti-racism consulting, and we had a very candid conversation. She was like, well, what, when you see a white woman like me, what do you think first? And I was like, how can I make her feel as safe as possible so I am as safe as possible? If that means crossing the sidewalk sooner, how do I create as much space so that she doesn't think Part of the reason I'm there is to do something to her, right? One of those awkward things that can happen with me on a sidewalk is if I'm behind someone and we're walking at the same speed, and you've probably had this too, I'm just like, do I, do I just walk at the same speed? Do they think I'm following them? Do I slow down? Do I speed up? And, you know, I just have to, I have to do that all the time, centering the feeling, not even the actual safety, the feeling of white people just for my own safety, right? Yeah, Ms. Jackson. And so to be in Black Rock City, I was just like, wow, this is, I, I'm just I'm just someone's neighbor. I am just like a person in the city and I'm a member of this community. Um, and I was kind of shocked out of that. Um, I wouldn't call it a fantasy, it's still, it's still very much a reality. Um, I remember I was unlocking a bike probably outside of Pink Mammoth and someone who appeared white and female uh, and not sober just came up to me and said, hey, and I was like, oh, another friendly person. And then they were like, why are you stealing my bike? And all of a sudden the weight of my identity and my race that I thought wasn't something holding me back kind of just fell back on me. And I, I was in the world again. Granted, this was an exception. This was just one person. I was like, oh no, this like ruined it. But it, it, it tainted it a bit um, because the implication that I was stealing something that wasn't mine just reminded me of the presumption of guilt that, that this has in the world. And so I'm kind of like still making the most of my week and it's almost the end. And, and I remember um, an older white lady comes up to me and says, hello. And you know, I, I learned not to just assume best intents now, especially when the other person might not know what they're saying, but she says, I'm just, thank you for being here. I said, why? And she said, because there's, so, when I started burning, there were so many people who look just like me. And now there's so many more people that look just like you. And I realized that was part of my gift like my joy, my resiliency with all of my identities, the way I play, the way I create art is a gift that is unique to me and that adds value to the city, to our community. And yeah, so that's, that's kind of it. Thank you, Nexus. 
Um, we have three more speakers that are scheduled and then we're actually forming a short queue of people that would like to speak for open mic. So uh, Rooster and then MC Boing Boing, who I'm not sure if he's still here, but if you're here, you're up next after that. And then Black Rock Smitty. So Rooster, please unmute yourself. Um, hi, uh, my name is Rooster, and um, I wanted to um, talk about the challenge of uh, leadership for people of color within the Burning Man community. And um, the, my perspective comes from my experience um, as a longtime Black Rock Ranger. And I want to use that experience to make a larger point about the challenge of leadership, not just within the Rangers or within Burning Man community but within America as a reflection back on the challenge within our own community. Um, I went to Burning Man first in 2001, joined the Rangers in 2003. Back then it was overwhelmingly white. And given that uh, being an Asian man, born and raised in San Francisco, that was a really enormous culture shock for me. Um, the Rangers recognized that back then they were overwhelmingly not just white but male and they recognized that they needed um to open themselves up to more women and they've made a tremendous effort in the last many years uh to invite more women to join the rangers and they've been really successful about that and they have uh, many more women today including women in uh, many positions of um of authority and so um well, and that's possible largely because of the fact that, you know, women make up something like almost half, if not more, of the population of Burning Man. Um, inviting people of color to join the Rangers has been a greater challenge. And I think part of that is the perception of what the Rangers are. Um, in the early years, I mean, you know, they look like authority figures. You know, people think of them as that. But the Rangers really aren't that. Uh, we like to think of ourselves more as authority figurines. And, you know, the real authority figures are higher up the chain. And so, but there's that perception of uh, you know, being in a position of telling others or advising people what to do. You know, rangering is, you know, you're a helper. And it's a form of leadership on a personal level. And, you know, in a larger society, that leadership, that helper thing, is never modeled for people of color. And certainly for... Asians, it's never ever presented that there's ever a model that there's an opportunity that you can be in charge of anything. And so the idea that you can join the Rangers, which is kind of a unique department within Burning Man because their perceived role is ours exclusively as helpers and, you know, community ambassadors, is much more of a challenge within the greater society. That sort of thing has never been modeled for you, has never been presented. In my entire working career, both in the corporate world and in theater production, everybody over me was a white person. And in my role as an event coordinator or a theater manager, I was the only person of color. So um, that's kind of, you know, unfortunately, I tend to be really good about highlighting an issue more than I am about offering solutions. Um, all I can say is that um, if more people of color were to give a thought of being a helper in our diverse community, then that would add diversity to the Rangers. And it's like with anything, you know, it's, it's like you see a reflection of yourself, you want to join it. And so that is my hope. Uh, and I think these type of uh, a challenge can exist in any department uh, within Burning Man or any camp or anything in which there are leadership positions that may not have been thought of as being open to people of color. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rooster. Next in the queue is Black Rock Smitty. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep, you sound great. All right, all right. How's everybody doing? Um, some of you know me from my letter to Burning Man, which was posted on uh, the largest Facebook group that I could find. Um, I want to try to keep this simple and brief. Um, what I said in my letter, perceptions and stereotypes. I've had my micro-racism experiences on the playa. Um, 
one quick short story that I did put in the letter is, um, you know, I camp at Ashram Galactica, which is awesome. And hello to all my campmates, because I know some of y'all are watching. Um, going into the bar one night, we go to Lily. Um, I saw a friend. I went to go talk to him, and there was one female, white female, sitting at the corner of the bar. And um, as I got closer to my friend, she started to make a statement. And um, she started with um, the way the world is today. And my friend kind of saw it come in. I didn't at first. And I was like, let her speak. And the first thing out of her mouth was, um, I was probably raised better than you. Which, you know, how do you figure that? How do you assume that? You might have had more than me, but you wasn't raised better than me, you know? But perceptions and stereotypes rule a lot of people's mentalities or in the default world. And people have to learn to leave that at the door when they come in the gate of Black Rock City. You know, at my camp, I've been presumed to be a worker, um, a bouncer, um, a doorman, whatever it may be. You know what I mean? Um, leave that shit at home. You know what I'm saying? Like when we're out there, we're all together. We're all burners. We're just, we're just people. We're human beings. Don't be afraid to talk to us. We're not afraid to talk to you. Um, just like somebody said, we have to make you guys comfortable. When I came to Black Rock City, knowing I was the minority, I didn't expect that to have to be the case. But sometimes it is. When I roll up to your camp and it's 20, 30, 40 of you outside and I have to be the first one to say hello, it's kind of awkward, you know, but I do it. I do it because, I, you know, I feel like I belong. I know I belong. Um, so the stereotypes and perceptions of what you may think or feel, leave it at the door. That's exempt. But overall, so for me, to me, everybody that's in here now watching or looking or, or participating, you're already, you know, where we want, we want, Um, the part that doesn't work is the people that need to hear this aren't here and they don't want to be here. They want to enjoy Black Rock City for what they feel like it is. They don't want the inclusion or the exclusion. And that's just what it is. To me personally, that's just what it is because I experienced that in the, in the real world, in the default world. Some people want, it to, want, it, want that inclusion. Some people just don't. And the people that don't, they're not going to listen to this. They didn't read my letter. They're not in this group now. And you can't figure out who those people are. You can't decipher who those people are. And they'll still come through the gate and they'll still do those microaggressions. So it's, it's going to be a tough battle, period. Um, when it comes to um, inclusion and getting making it more diverse, I don't believe that that's something that's directly up to the org. Um, you know, because nobody told me about Burning Man. I found out about it on my own, on a humbug. And um, I'm here. Nobody can stop me from getting there. Um, and if it's something that's a word of mouth thing, then a lot of people aren't sharing the information or telling people or exposing people to it. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily on the org to handle that. I think it's a community thing to somewhat handle that. You know what I mean? I, we're all in this together. So, you know, um, um, other than that, um, I was trying to make it quick and brief. I've been sitting here waiting for a minute antsy and excited about this. Um, <laughs> that's the bell. I was waiting for that bell. <laughs> Um, but I just want to say thank you to everybody for the, for the few moments. I love all of you. I hope to see you next year at the dust. Everybody that's read my letter that said you was coming to my camp, you better be at my camp next year. And um, if we get to go next year, everybody pray, please. Um, but thank you for the time. And um, everybody have a good night. But I'm going to stay back and listen. Thank you, Smitty. Black Rock Smitty. Um, and thank you also for writing that piece. I think just as an example to everyone else out there, you know, we have the Burning Man Journal and other spaces to help elevate voices out there. So um, if you have a story, if you have something that you want to share and have you read, uh, we're going to try to make those spaces um, more clearly accessible. They're already accessible, but we want to make it real clear that uh, we want to share those stories that way. So. Um, Thank you. I'm going to start the open mic now. And uh, it, it, given the time that it's 6.51 PM Pacific, we're only going to be able to probably get two to three folks out of the let me count 12 people that we have before 7 o'clock. Um, so like I said, we'll, some, some of us will stay on after 7. But we do. Uh, it might feel a little awkward, but we're probably going to do some closing remarks uh, just for those who want to close it out, and then we'll stick around to hear the folks in the queue. So Marshmallow, you're up next, and then Juan, and then Jared Paul. All right. So um, hi, I'm Marshmallow. Uh, I'm from Israel. I started burning in 2014, did 14 regionals and two Black Rock cities. Um, I've been discriminated against for race, for sex, for my sexual orientation, for my age, 
and for my geekiness, I don't know, for a lot of stuff. But then the first time I encountered Burning Man and the burn culture, um, I wanted to share like a few positive notes. So one of the uh, regionals I've been to is something called Borderland in Denmark, where I camped with a bunch of Swedes. Uh, and every time I would walk, they would switch from speaking Swedish to speaking English. Even if I wasn't part of the conversation, they just did that. And that was like wonderful. Um, one thing I did at that burn was for an entire evening, I put my buff on my eyes and then went around uh, holding my arms like this. And whoever went in and hugged me, um, I just let them. And that was wonderful because I didn't actually knew uh, who was hugging me and I didn't have any thoughts or like have any uh, preconditioned uh, thoughts about who was uh, interacting with me. And also I got to experience the burn as somebody um, with a disability that they can see. And actually a burn is kind of fun even if you don't have one of your senses on. Um, and I think the first time I really, really, really uh, felt radical inclusion at a burn uh, was at BRCVR because it does not matter if you're black, white, purple, pink, orange, or whatever your avatar is color, you don't really see the person in there and you treat everybody as equals. Uh, and I think for the first time, I really felt uh, radical inclusion. So anybody with a computer headset or not headset on them, I could really feel, you know, they're the same, the same as I am. And on another note, as an artist, it's the first time I actually felt like I could build like a large scale art installation because I'm all the way out here at the other side of the world where it's like almost 5 a.m. for me and I could build something really amazing and have people enjoy and appreciate it, which I could not have done ever at Burning Man. So that's another thing. And that's it, I think that's enough. Thank you. Thanks for that share, Marshmallow. And thank you everyone for sharing your stories. We are at about five minutes until the hour. So we are gonna just do our closing remarks. Um, if you've been inspired to share your story and are not planning on staying to speak in the open mic queue, uh, we would love and invite for you to share a written or recorded statement. And you can email that to diversity at burningman.org. On our end, what we're gonna do is compile this video recording to share with more internal staff members. We're also gonna add in the other recordings that we've received and the written statements. And we will publish through Burning Man Project um, that this recording, those videos, and those written statements for which we've received consent to share publicly. Um, so just want to let you know what's going to happen so that we can be accountable to you and then I'll pass it back over to level Thanks Molly Rose. So thank you everyone who shared your stories. They're so real and so thoughtful and um, Some are really positive and uplifting and some are really hard. So uh, I wish we actually had time to respond so I wanted to at least let folks know that over time we will respond. Um, you know, we don't have like a formal couched response now and I'm sure a lot of my colleagues here really want to jump in and say stuff. So thank you for everyone who's participated in the chat. Um, and I saw some comments too. I, I said this at the very start, but um, this is the start. You know, this is the first town hall that we've had of its kind. Uh, we definitely have more planned in the future and we want to potentially have them quarterly, definitely another one in the spring. Um, and realize that today's focus was racism and anti-racism, but there are so many intersectional issues and identities and groups that we want to feature in future town halls. So thanks for setting the model here today. Uh, it, yeah, it was fantastic. Thanks for taking the risk to come and thanks to my colleagues for sitting and listening. I think a lot of times people want us to talk and have the answers, but I think the answers really lie collectively in our community and we want to acknowledge that. Um, a couple last things that we did want to share. Uh, there is, if you have not sort of followed along, uh, Burning Man Project has posted a couple Burning Man Journal posts. Uh, we posted one today about cultural direction setting and lessons on diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, how we try to incorporate that into the work on that project. Um, I'm going to share a link to that in chat so that you can uh, see it. And then we also shared, oh, looks like Mara just said thank you. Um, we also 
have a, an update from the Burning Man project that we posted in August that really outlines the way we're approaching this work. So some of it is around really in, looking at data, looking at things internally, looking at uh, anti-racism trainings that we can hold. Um, and some of it is about engaging the community like town halls like this. So please read that. Um, and like Molly Rose said, if you have more feedback or ideas or thoughts, uh, help be a part of the solution and help us figure it out. And um, please email us at diversity at, diversity at burningman.org. My final thanks, I just want to give some acknowledgements, is to, uh, we have an internal diversity chat group and a facilitation group um, that meets every other week and we're kind of diving deep into all sorts of topics internally. Um, so they've been our backstage folks, uh, ringing the bell, muting people, sending reminders about things. Uh, so Emma uh, from Burns Without Borders, thank you Emma. James from the uh, comms, Newsboy, thank you. And Meron from the A-Team, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you to Molly Rose for co-emceeing, um, and thank you all for showing up today. And now... Yay, it is, look at us, right on time. It is 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern, 5 a.m. Israel. And so we do want to officially close the call so that everyone feels like they can hop off and attend to other things. However, if you uh, or anyone who hasn't signed up yet is feeling inspired to tell your story and take this opportunity to record your story. We are happy to stay on and continue capturing those recordings for anyone in the room who would like to share. So a big thank you again to everyone for joining us and for being here for these two hours. The majority of people stayed for the full time and it's just so beautiful. So we're gonna give one minute for folks to drop off. And if you'd like to hang back and share your story and you're not in the list yet, then just go ahead and type into the chat box um, and we'll keep the list going and unmute folks as soon as we've had everybody fall off who's going to fall off. So thank you and I love all of you. Just so folks know, we have, it looks like nine folks in the queue now. So. Hopefully we, we can get through them. Uh, we'll hold to the four minute time limit um, and you'll get a 30 second bell ring if uh, at three minutes and 30 seconds. So if you finish before then, we'll just move on. Um, so next in the queue are Juan Peralta and then Jared Paul, and then uh, we'll call the next people after that. So Juan, you there? I'm here. Uh, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Juan, Juan Peralta. I've been to Burning Man in 2013 and also in 2017. And uh, I just want to say that in the two, I, I haven't been to Burning Man a lot, but the two times that I did go, I can say that I did feel quite included and that I have not ever felt any sort of exclusion based on my race. Um, and I can say that I've felt pretty well included. Um, uh, as far as the Burning Man community goes and all the people surrounding that that I've had encounters with, I can say uh, the overwhelming majority have been quite inclusive. And I'd also like to chime in and agree with other people who've spoken here tonight to say that people who are, uh, you know, of color, of minority, of different racial backgrounds are on a spectrum and we're not all the same. And I can say that from what I've experienced of Burning Man, it, it has fulfilled some, some things that I've had, uh, some curiosities that I've had to encounter people being uh, radically self-expressive, radically inclusive, and, and all of those other principles. And I really appreciate that. And I would appreciate uh, the opportunity to be included in a way that's not patronizing. So, you know, different people have different uh, thresholds for what kind of interaction they're willing to tolerate. Some people can put up with meaner people, some people not so much. And uh, when I go to something like Burning Man, I, I tend to, like, I'm open to whatever people have to offer. And uh, I consider it, um, I consider it uh, an aspect of, you know, of uh, civic responsibility to take it upon yourself to encounter that and to mold that experience to what you want it to be in the future. So if I experience someone being bigoted or exclusive or mean to me, uh, I don't wait for someone else to come solve that problem for me. I, I engage with it directly. And so that's what I would like to say uh, to other people like me is that, uh, you know, I am going to take it upon myself when I, you know, I'm still gonna come to Burning Man when I can and, and enjoy this community. And I'm gonna take it upon myself to, to deal with that stuff head on 
and to not be fragile and to be also forgiving to people because I know that people can be, I know that people when they're in their moment can say just whatever's on their mind and they not, may not be totally thoughtful of what the other person is experiencing and uh, you know, not everyone goes well together. So I'm generally more on the forgiving side and I would like for that to continue and, and I would like for people to not censor themselves or hold back what they're really thinking just because they think they might hurt my feelings. Um, I would rather uh, know your true and honest self than part of you that's trying to like, you know, cushion me or protect me. Uh, so that's all I have on that. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Um, next is Jared Paul and then Garrick. Tonight's been way cooler than I anticipated. I was excited about it, but it's it's really blowing me away. Uh, I, I want to I want to echo what Juan was saying, what other people have said about the spectrum, and I want to expand on that. I'm half white and half indigenous, and when I first began burning in 2001, it was amazing to be there and no one cared that I was brown. Because, you know, growing up in Southern California and being Kanaka Maui, which is native Hawaiian, and Apache, everyone just sort of assumes that you're Latino and that's fine. And you also get treated a little bit differently. But when I went to the Pi for the first time, as a young man, I was 19 and brown, and neither of those things mattered. So it was this utopic gift or experience that other people have also talked about uh, earlier tonight. And if you had asked me back then what my thoughts were about diversifying the city, I probably would have been reluctant to engage because I was for the first time having that freedom to be me and to move about without people thrusting racism on. You know, over the years, you know, I was 19, I'm 39 now, so I've been burning for half my life. 10 years ago, my answer would have been different. And then now, in these past few years of this awakening and this sort of coming to reality moment in our nation, I, my attitudes are changing. And I think that we should afford room not only for the spectrum, but also for people to evolve and maybe people of color as they develop and embrace their identities and their heritage, they might have a different set of needs one year than the next year. Um, and then also, there's this hierarchy of race in our society that I think is important to acknowledge. So I'm indigenous, but I'm not black. And so this last summer, especially with, with all of the, everything that's been spoken about, I've been doing a lot of the anti-racism work to explore how, even though I may not be a white person, there's undoubtedly socialized ills inside of me about other groups of people and so I, I just it's it's complicated and i'm grateful for this and i hope that we continue to have these conversations about race because five years from now there might be somebody who wasn't thinking about this and now they are and then the only other thing i wanted to mention was um about my camp's experience in addressing diversity my camp's ratio or demographics pretty much mirror black rock cities right now so i, I think that's what like 15 percent or so people of color and, and uh, very few people who are, are of African descent. And it's a difficult conversation to have and we're nowhere close to having a solution because we don't want to tokenize people. We don't want to patronize people. Uh, I've gone back and forth on whether or not I want to be involved in diversifying our camp. And a lot of the other people of color in our camp have also had a mix of responses. So, Thus far, the leading idea that we have is that because our camp is word of mouth, we need to not think about just how do we talk to more people of color about Burning Man, but we need to diversify our lives in the default world. Because if it's word of mouth, and if the majority of the people who we socialize with and have adventures with are one stock of people, we're never gonna achieve this goal of diversifying our, our Playa family if we rely on word of mouth alone. So we're, we're, we're doing, a lot of us are, are doing that work to put ourselves in other spaces where we may be the other in ways that we weren't before. Thank you again for this. This is wonderful. Thank you, Jared. All right, next up we have Garrick um, and then Tony and Jessa in the queue. So yeah, 
My name is Gary here from Vancouver. Great to be here. It's been an amazing conversation and very fascinating. Four minutes is not much time, but yeah, my friend and I up here in Vancouver 11 years ago, we started a thing called the Decentralized Dance Party where we get hundreds of portable boom boxes synchronized with a radio transmitter and then we do roaming party experiences through city streets and we've been doing them all over the world. Went to Burning Man for the first time in 2012 and it was amazing to discover this party civilization and see all these parallels between the experiences that we had creating, we had been uh, creating. And yeah, it's been really incredible to create these party experiences in public where initially it was just us and close friends, but then during the Olympics, we noticed that everyone, regardless of class or age or background or even people that had disabilities or people that were homeless were joining in and it was just this instant venue for these moments of like pure perfect abandon and self-expression and people resonating on that level and from the beginning yeah i've been fascinated by this idea of how to create the most inclusive party possible and how to take this burning man spirit and have it sent back out into the world and recently joined uh, Sparkleverse. We helped to co-create the Sparkleverse Burning Man. And yeah, it's just been fascinating to see the potentials for uniting people in these new venues with the spirit, spirit and continually lowering the barriers for participation so anyone can join. And yeah, I've just always been fascinated by the dichotomy within Burning Man of radical self-expression and radical inclusion and how we can best tiptoe that line and have as many people as possible feel welcome. And I guess, yeah, the thing I forgot to mention was that with these parties, our ultimate vision is to hopefully host a simultaneous global dance party and I believe if that was pulled off, a Nobel Peace Prize would be possible for doing that. I think that uh, these party experiences that we create together, I, I think this is the most powerful possible force for unifying humanity. I think what we're doing and the Sparkleverse and Burning Man, I think this is the greatest potential movement that will allow us to, to align as not a resistance movement against things that we don't like in society, but an acceptance movement where we're all on the same team and we're all aligned and rallying together. And yeah, I'm just very passionate about making sure that this spirit of unity isn't lost. And it was really good to be here today and hear this very calm, balanced, nuanced conversation. And yeah, love to connect with as many people here as possible who really care about keeping this sacred fire of partying lit and burning bright because I think we need it more than ever right now. So I'll post a link to my contact and yeah, love to hear from you guys. Hopefully. Thank you, Eric. Oh, sorry. Did I get you off? All right, thank you, Garrick. Um, Tony, you are up next, and then Jessa. Okay. Okay, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. Can everybody hear me and see me? Okay. Um, I, I, I want to first of all say I am not a person of color, but I am so, have so much gratitude for being on this call because it's, educated me it's all about education and i'm thinking about um my camp i've camped at camp naked heart and it's anasana village and how the lack of diversity in that camp so i'm part of the leadership team so one of my missions now is to talk among our group and what can we do to make our camp more more um welcome to people of color we don't get much many people of color in our workshops and there's probably a reason why 
So thank you so much, and that's what I'm going to do. But I want to. I am transgender, and I have a disability. So I do experience um, exclusion in the default world and at Burning Man. And I do have to have this radar always on for my safety. And I was hoping at Burning Man I could turn that radar off, but I did not feel what at camp I did and during and the village I did, but out on the playa, I still felt like I had to keep that radar on, especially with all the drinking involved. Usually the incidents I had was when people were quite drunk. Um, I was told at one, I was very, very, very cold and I didn't prepare for being out late at night and that happened. So I went to this camp and asked if I could sit by their fire to warm up. And they said, yes, I, I don't want to just pop in. But then I heard one, someone on the speaker say, please leave our camp now. And I don't know why, but I mean, it could, it, it could be a multiple of reasons. I don't want to make assumptions, but that was a little bit disconcerting. Um, the biggest issue I had was workshops. I, I, we were at the workshop camp, so I've led like hundreds of workshops and attended literally several hundred workshops as well. And issues with the workshops that were for women only. So, the, and that was considered, and it's, it's changed a lot in the last couple of years, but they were considered biological females. And I was specifically, even though I cleared it with the leader, with the, for the facilitator, I walked in and was not welcome at all. I was told there was a man in, the, in, in, in here, we have to get rid of him. And so I do see more and more workshops, it says for folks who identify as female. So that's, that's an improvement, but the main thing I want to say is, I know four minutes is hard. I love talking to people at Burning Man. I just go wander around and talk to different people and join their camps. And, and they're only, as far as I know, there's only one camp that is open, that is mainly almost 100%, at least 90% transgender and non-binary folks. So I asked them, you know, so what, what's your burn experience in like? And we had workshops there. And of course, I was safe and welcome there. And I asked them, you know, what do you do during your time? What do you do at, what's your burn like? And they says, well, we just hang out at camp. And I go, well, why? Don't, don't, there's so much stuff to see. And not everybody, but a lot of people said they just don't feel safe. They feel safe in their camp, but they don't feel safe. And I said, well, what about the um, queer camps? And they said, no, we don't feel, we even feel stigmatized at the queer camps. Um, I didn't, that was not my experience, but I just love talking to people. So if, to me, if more than one thing, there's some truth to that. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. And I really have gratitude for everybody on this call. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. I just want to call out that Tina's wanting to connect. So check in the chat box to connect with her. Um, next, we're going to hear from Jessa, followed by Whitney Mooney, Chris, and then Kevin. So Jessa, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi guys, I'm Cher Bear. Um, I'll be really quick because I really just want to elevate um, BIPOC voices. Um, I just wanted to say, I thought this was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for all the people of color sharing their stories. Um, I was just wanting to mention that, you know, as white allies, um, something that I've been doing the last five years that I would really love to see more conversation around is how we as white people can spend our privilege on and off the playa. Um, something I've been doing is um, helping a person of color each burn, understand like how they can burn, giving them information, reaching out. Um, I've also been gifting tickets to people of color every year. Working with the um, Black Burner Project is a great example, getting involved with her, seeing how you can help with her on Instagram. I just thought I would kind of do a plug in here for anyone that, you know, is a white ally that is is looking to, to participate more. I know that's something that I'm constantly looking for is how I can spend my privilege. I think that's a really beautiful um, way to put it that someone, you know, taught me once of how, what we can do to specifically get more people out there. Because I think that the more we as white allies can, um, you know, provide that space of education and using the things, the tools that we have in order to help other people get out there and understand and learn more about it um, is going to help with that diversity as well. So 
um, I'm definitely open for conversation. I'll put my uh, information in chat, but if anyone else has any more information on white allies and on how you can spend your privilege more or would love to connect to do that, I would really love to uh, participate more. So thanks. So nice to meet you all. Thank you, Share Bear. Next in the open mic queue is Whitney Mooney. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so I had not planned on speaking at all. Uh, I actually, when you guys were showing that video um, that was on YouTube, I one section that really resonated with me was the idea that perhaps our norms were created, our, our principles were created without um, people in color people of color in mind. Um, and I think that really stood out to me, especially um, I think as a black person, we look at different aspects of, you know, the racist experience or experiencing racism. Um, and not so much that it's racism per se, um, but I think the thing that I noticed the most about Playa is the use of black hairstyles, um, especially used as a party hairstyle. Um, as a black person, my hair has always been politicized. The fact that there are bills right now um, in Congress to try to make it acceptable for us to wear our natural hairstyles in the workplace, for us to not be fired for that, I think um, speaks volumes as to where we are and the acceptance of black bodies and how they're politicized currently. And I think that it was really great of Burning Man to provide um, education about the use of headdresses um, at the event, especially considering the fact that we are, you know, our proximity to Native American land. Uh, with that said, I think that Burning Man has a long way to go in terms of providing education for, you know, the population. Um, I think that there's not a lot of conversation that really happens in terms of the appropriation of black hairstyles. And I think that that's something that we should bring into conversation a little bit more. Um, you know, personally, I, I had a lot of really difficult experiences growing up with my curly uh, hair and, you know, trying to braid it or doing XYZ to my hair that was seen as more urban, more ghetto, XYZ, you know, whatever. Um, and I still think that there's a lot that Burning Man can do in terms of bridging that gap of knowledge. Um, I don't think that our principles are set in stone. I think that we have a lot of um, a amending to do in regards to our principles. I think there's a lot of opportunity to hide behind radical self-expression. Um, and really using radical self-expression as a means of not extending that radical inclusivity. Um, but that's just one aspect of my experience. Otherwise, um, it's, it's been an incredible experience. And I, I think, like I said, I think that education could go a long way. I've got in my, the camps that I've participated in have been primarily white burners and they've been really great about um, having conversations with people about the use of headdresses. Um, the irony of seeing them do that with appropriated black hairstyles has not been lost on me at all. And um, I think that as we start to have a lot more conversations like these, that there will be a lot more education provided to the rest of the burner community. And I just wanna thank you guys so much for hosting this, for allowing me a little bit of space to speak my piece um, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Whitney. Uh, next in the queue, we have Chris, followed by Kevin and then Fran. So Chris, you can go ahead and unmute. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? All right. Um, thank you for having this and, and um, allowing me to be heard. Since the last burn, I have carried a tremendous hurt from Burning Man and from the organization itself around race. Um, so I'm a native I, you know, from here, and our experience here has been um, pretty bad, as you can imagine, historically. But one of the things that you know plagues uh, um, our culture, some of our cultures, is uh, um, shame. You know, the teaching that we should be ashamed of our culture, of our race, of our language, of uh, our everything and um it, it just permeates all of um you know recent ancestors back to the grandparents um at least for my tribe before uh white people um took our our, our lands we were one of the last tribes um and i find that burning man a lot of people say that people see you for your spirit that's not the experience i find i cannot converse with any white people without being the ambassador of all native people all the time nonstop, and i can deal with that 
because that's just the way it is everywhere in this country for me. And, um, and I'm proud of who I am now. And I'm in my 50s, so it took me a while, until my 30s, until I stopped thinking that I was super ugly and weird and wanting to be a white and change my, my hair to be, or, you know, just this effed up way of thinking of oneself that was like a demon that's hidden that you can't even see. But, you know, I was taught, um, uh, it was explained to me how that happened. And Burning Man, though, is a place that, you know, when I do speak of it, I'm speaking to an open, receptive audience. And I really appreciate that. And I work for the organization as an employee, and I belong to two, and I, I'm, I'm so hurt that I might even start crying now. I don't, I don't want to, but I, I work for two orgs. One of them is diverse and inclusive, and one of them is not. And I'm not going to name them because I love them both, and I, I want to be part of them. But this last month, last year, when I was working, um, a particular individual started to ostracize me from one of my groups in a very uh, um, strong way. I, it's the, the way I, I can't put it in any other way. So much so that I, I, I could, I, it affected me deeply. I couldn't figure it out. And then I remember what it was like growing up uh, in the 70s in Oregon, in white Oregon, and how I was ostracized back then and what the, how that affected me and how that came back. In my 50s, I thought it was all taken care of, but it wasn't. I was so hurt and distraught. So I went to the, uh, the org and told them, this is happening, help. I went to my manager, help. I went to people in the department, help. And not one person helped me or stood up. And it was, I'm still plagued by it. And I'm driving around, this is my fifth month driving around the West and everywhere I go, I see native lands and I can't help but go back to Burning Man and the org and how little they did. Because what the only thing they could say to me is that I had triggered this person because it was the Me Too movement, but no consideration to like me saying, "Look, man, I'm I'm hurt deeply by it, and it, I'm happy that you're listening now, but it, it it saddens me that in the moment when it wasn't a thing in our society like it is now, there was nobody who would hear or nobody who would who would stand up for me, and the only person who did." Um, at one of these counseling sessions where I went to say, look, I need help was a person of color like me. And we locked eyes and he knew he just wait, he just, he just nodded. He, he knew what I was talking about, like the hurt that I felt. And, um, that's all I wanted to share that you, so you know that, you know, when a colored person comes to you and says, Hey, I don't feel good. You know, something's happening to me and it's not cool. Like, listen and Make it important, you know, and not like it's second to something else. Um, that's all I have to say, really, that I, I'm not naming anything because I, you know, I do believe in, in the Oregon, the intentions in the, in the groups I work for, but I want it to be known that there's so much more improvement necessary um, within the Birdie Man organization. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Chris. Really appreciate that. Uh, next in the queue, we are going to hear from Kevin, followed by Fran, followed by Carla. Hi there. Unmuted. Uh, so hi, yes, uh, my name's uh, Fran X. I'm a uh, one, or I guess a pretty young burner. I've only been once uh, this last year. However, studied the event uh, for quite a while. Ten years of trying to apply different kind of like school grads to, to get to go, finally made it, and um, was really interested in what kind of community is, you know, born out of, of these 10 principles, which seemed pretty kind of amazing to me. And in uh, experiencing it for the first time, and it was a really, for me, an inclusive experience and, and a freeing experience, much of what we've heard tonight. Um, but also at the same time, Somewhere, you know, in this, in that week, found myself asking, uh, you know, where, where is my home? Like, is this my home? Where, not where are people that look like me, but where is that space that, you know, everyone seems to have? And I'm, I'm really just uh, responding to, you know, comments of kind of intentionality and the need for bigger art by 
um, you know, people of color. And here to represent the Solar Shrine, um, Antoine Lee is an uh, artist, a uh, grant honorarium uh, for this past year, and he's on the call. How, however, um, I just felt the need to kind of let everyone know what the space is that we'd really like to uh, bring to uh, Burning Man. In in having this other experience with virtual burn this year, we did kind of just hear a lot of um, people, you know, respond and say, you know, we need this as a space for everyone to kind of feel that safety and unity. Um, it's it's kind of a, a work in progress right now, what exactly it is that we we want to, to bring. I think that was the other question was in intentionally at being a space um, for kind of BIPOC camps, like what is it that we're going to be teaching or, or kind of um, representing? And so far, you know, it's pretty simple. If you think about the term Afrofuturism, it, it is a way of reimagining kind of uh, the Black narrative specifically. But I think in that, you know, you touch on all other kind of cultures and uh, doing this through performance and through uh, through conversations uh, about you know community organization and and how to bring more connectivity to Burning Man, um, this is kind of something that we want to do uh, right now is reach out to all the other camps um, that are uh, associated with diversity. Uh, as we're just an art installation, we only have kind of this one year, and we really, whichever year that is, we really want to, you know be a space that welcomes and hosts all kinds of conversations because we have that visibility on the playa. Um, and it's not just a camp, maybe that is just a place to start, uh, but please, you know, reach out to us and get to know the uh, shrine a little bit. And I see someone went ahead and posted in the chat, but yeah, we'll be here to, you know, hopefully see everyone in 2021. Um, so thank you, thank you for that spotlight. Thank you, Fran. I posted this in chat, um, but the we only have three more speakers. So thank you for everyone who st stuck around this extra time. Um, if you would still like to get in the queue, let us know. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up after these next three. So next we have Carla. Carla, if you don't mind unmuting yourself. All right, done. Um, can you hear me? Yep, you sound yeah. great. All right, good. Uh, so. My son, uh, this is my son's party, and he started inviting me years ago, but it took me years until 2018 to actually come and, and to have my life changed, which happened. Um, part of that, I will admit, is a boycott of the United States. I'm Canadian, and uh, my family's all over the world, so I've traveled extensively. I've, I've been, I've, I love Vietnam, I've traveled to Venezuela, I've been in Ireland, England. New Zealand, Thailand, all over the world, and I've never experienced racism like I have in the US. So I said to myself, I don't, I don't actually need to contribute to an economy that doesn't want me. So I stopped coming. Um, I regretfully left NOLA behind because New Orleans is just outstanding. It's one of my favorite places in the world, but I said, no, I'm not gonna do it. But I, I, I listened to my son and I came to the playa and I'm not sad I did. To me, it's an international space. It feels more like the United Nations. Although it's in New York, it's, it's international. So I, um, I felt really welcome and fantastic on the playa. I have never experienced anything negative like some of the other speakers have said in 2018 or 19. But what I observed was um, somebody in a, a Facebook group that I'm on, uh, a young black woman who lives in New York, said, oh, well, you're going to Burning Man. That's, that's really, that's white. That's like, um, what did she compare it to? Coachella. And I said, oh, that, this was after 2019, after I'd been, and I said, that wasn't my experience at all. I, um, because I volunteer, I'm, my, um, my camp is the uh, music camp. God, what is it? Reverbia. So, so that gets a lot of, it's right on Esplanade. So it gets a lot of, a lot. we see a lot of, of the playa. And I would volunteer at the coffee shop at Center Camp. So I see the world. I hear um, Hebrew. I hear Spanish. I hear Russian. I hear every language on the planet. Japanese, you name it. Urdu. Um, so I see 
races and ethnicities. I see children, small children. I see toddlers, infants, young children. I see elderly citizens. I see persons with disabilities. I see transgender people. I see the full range of diversity, not in huge numbers. Of course, white, is, white able-bodied cis is still the majority overwhelmingly, but every single day I saw people speaking different languages, looking different, every every range of people. So I was curious about her perception that it was Coachella, that it was a, a, an extremely white space. Um, I was part of that photograph last year as well and, and felt wonderful and, and welcomed. At the end of camp, at the end of, uh, on the last day, or the second last day last year, um, a very tall white man from England approached me and asked me if I would if I could be part of his video. And it's called, if you YouTube it, it's called Burning Man 2019, beautiful, as in Christina Aguilera's beautiful. His name is Care Factor Nil 71. But if you just Google Burning Man 2019, beautiful, you'll get this video of folks lip syncing. And the first thing I said to him was, um, tell me about the diversity of your video. What's it going to look like? <laughs> because if I'm if I'm going to be the token, I'd rather not. Um, what does your video look like? Does it look like Burning Man? And he said, yes, it will look like Burning Man. And it does. It, it looks like Burning Man. It doesn't look like the regular video. So I thought, well, there's the problem right there. When I look at, oh, I'm sorry. When I look at Burning Man videos online, I see 22, 23, 24, 25, blonde, white, very shapely, young. I see a certain representation of Burning Man and that's all I see. So as Marshall McLuhan, um, the Canadian philosopher said, the medium is the message. If all of the videos are out there, out there are featuring this one type of burner, that's where the public perception is coming from. And that's what's leading to some of the issues where we hear people say, yeah, my, my friends of color aren't interested in coming to Burning Man. So, so I think it's an image problem. And I think that's because we've got a lot of people capturing that one look and that one look becoming representative, unfortunately, for people who haven't been. So anyway, something to consider that we need more photographers and videographers uh, of getting, capturing the whole spectrum. That's all I got. Thank you, Carla. Thank you everyone for just, always. everyone's bringing such a different perspective and another element of complexity that's important for us to think about. So thank you. Uh, Ulan, you're up next. Hey, I'm of two minds because I didn't want to speak, but now I do want to speak, and I guess I don't want to speak. Um, I've been going to Burning Man th since 2012. Um, I'm from the Bay Area, and I always used to love San Francisco when Burning Man was going on because, in my opinion, all the bad people were leaving, and we could just hang out and like have like normal conversations. And then a friend of mine got me to go, gave me a free ticket, and it completely changed my life. And... I have, um, subsequent to 2012, pretty much reoriented what I'm doing from tech, and now I just try and build every day. Um, we've uh, been part of a number of camps where the focus is on building, mutant vehicles, sound systems, and whatnot, and um, it is just part of what we do to be inclusive and to be open with intention. And so when we get to a space um, within our own camp um, where it is mostly one kind of people, we have conversations about that. And so we're never in a space where we feel comfortable if it's five of one type of person, there's a conversation around like, is that an okay thing to be doing? Not that there's anything inherently wrong with it, but just as sort of a motivator to just look around on a regular basis and just ask yourself, like, is this the environment that I want to be creating? And a lot of it can say, just feel almost unintentional, like it just happens that way. Um, someone who was speaking mentioned, you know, if it's word of mouth only, um, and all the people or most of the people that you talk to look a certain way, well, then, you know, you might have that. And so, a big part of what we try and do is sort of try and figure out, well, what are we doing wrong? Because as a former teacher, it was like, if I'm not reaching my students, it's my fault, it's not their fault. And so if we instead sort of internalize this 
I actually want to create what I want to create, whether it's my art or whether it's my camp, if we can internalize this idea of creating what we actually want rather than say, well, you know, there are just a lot of white people around and so they're just going to be a lot of white people around. And it's like, it doesn't have to be that way. And I would just um, say that I don't feel like we're always successful, but we very much try uh, to uh, be welcoming and listen. Um, I think it was Chris who said, and I really, I really resonated with what he was saying. Um, when someone of color comes, particularly talking about feeling unwelcome based around some racialized issue, it's a different kind of conversation than, oh, you know what, my drink doesn't taste good. It's like, it has to be, if people want people of color to feel welcome, when people of color speak, you actually have to listen to them and not put it through the lens of, what am I experience? How would I look at this? Well, maybe it really wasn't a racialized thing and just take it. It's not your fault. It's not because of some intention you did. But sometimes I think that we just need to sit in a space of getting new information and being comfortable with something that makes us uncomfortable. So thank you. Thank you, Ulan. All right, we only have two speakers left, and then thank you again for when the, for sticking on longer. Uh, Secret is probably not going to come back on camera because she's having some bandwidth issues, but she will still speak next. So, Secret, go ahead. Okay, everyone, I'm going to try this again. Um, so, um, I just really want to appreciate the stories that have been shared here. Um, I especially want to thank all of those that maybe did not have a really great experience at Burning Man at one point or another and trusting us with that story. I think that's really amazing. Um, I was saying that I was a regional contact. Um, I've been to Burning Man since 2011. This would have been my 10th year, um, but I'm still so celebrating um, Burning Man in different capacities. Um, I think it's um, one of the things, especially with just everything that has been happening um, in our world, which is nothing new, um, I've just been trying to be more aware of the presence that I'm coming in with um, and the space that I'm holding. And I do identify as a person of color. I'm uh, first generation proving American. Um, uh, but all of the spaces that I've grown up in have been predominantly white. And I recognize that it's been a privilege that I've been able to navigate in those spaces. And I don't think Burning Man is anything different for me. Um, I've had amazing experiences at Burning Man, amazing experiences in my camp with lamplighters, but I recognize that I may have been able to access it easier. And so I think it's just really important to be aware of that and recognize that that's not the same for other people of color and possibly those that are much darker um, in skin tone and have had more difficulties in that. And so recognizing how I contribute, contribute in those spaces, um, even with things that you know, I may have already been engaging with in terms of like the white supremacy that makes up our culture and the spaces. Um, so I think just, I think this space especially has just brought that up even more that I need to be conscious of the space that I bring up, even though I may identify as a person of color. Um, so yeah, so I really appreciate everyone. And I'm smiling. <laughs> Thank you, Secret. You're secretly smiling. Um, all right, we're gonna go with our last two speakers. I got someone to squeeze in right at the minute. So Kobe, you're next, and then we'll wrap up with Moonshine. Okay, great. Can everybody hear me? Is my audio okay? It's good? You can hear? Okay. Um, I'll make it really quick. Uh, my first burn was in 18, second was in 19. First burn was just, wow, this is what I needed. You know, lots of stuff going on. It expanded my consciousness, expanded my mind and everything. The next burn was all about um, uh, me learning about myself in terms of uh, how I interact with other people, how I interact with what, what, what I can give to other people. But um, one of the biggest things that happened a little bit on the first, a lot on the second, is that I got tons of microaggressions, micro violations, micro racisms, all that kind of stuff. And um, 
one of the things in talking with people about it, um, uh, and I'm going to touch on a bit of what Carla talked on and a little bit of what uh, Smitty was talking about, is that one of the only ways that I think, well, the burn, the Black Rock City is a city, it's a microcosm of, you know, we, we want it to be this, um, not utopic, but this thing that we want to move to, but it's always going to be a microcosm of the world and more so a microcosm of the USA. And so you're always going to have these racist people that are going to show up and they're going to say racist things. And a lot of them don't know that they're racist. One of the biggest ways to change that is going to be uh, representation. You know, lots of um, people of color and uh, black folks uh, showing up and being there. And we're doing crazy about spreading it with word of mouth. I was about to bring an army of virgins this year, but then it got canceled. Um, now, the thing that I was talking with the force from uh, Disorient Camp a lot about last year was that um, getting black folks out there and wh what role uh, Burning Man itself has in getting black folks out there. I don't think Burning Man has an explicit role to get folks out there, but if they want, if Burning Man wants change to happen, then they should uh, look into some of, the, uh, some of the things that people have been talking about today and a lot of other ways to promote getting uh, people of color and black folks out there because we can definitely do a word of mouth, but it's going to take a long time. And so if Burning Man's fine with, um, you know, the, these microaggressions, these macroaggressions, and a lot of the racist people showing up for a while, then definitely hands off. Because one of the things that I talk about with Force is how Burning Man has always had this thing about not promoting what Burning Man is. And that's why you have a lot of people that think that it's all rich people like Puffy that come out and a bunch of people just looking for to see breasts on the weekend or something, you know? Because that's what you see. And I think Carla was talking about that. That's what you see in the videos. You see a very certain type. And, you know, being out there for two years, I know that that's a very small, actually a very small part of what Burning Man is and what Burning Man could be. So just saying that um, definitely it is an organic thing that has to happen, but uh, um, uh, Burning Man itself can get in there and um, accelerate the process if they want the process to be accelerated. If Burning Man wants to keep on this hands-off approach and have people getting the wrong idea and not getting, and essentially not getting more POC and black folks in there in a sooner time, then that's fine. Um, I'm down to do the work and get people in there. And, you know, I learn about racist white people all the time. And uh, if I have to keep coming every year and dealing with this stuff, you know, like being people casually dropping the N bombs and like saying all this other stuff and like, um, you know, exploiting me in certain ways, that's just what I'm going to do. And it'll be a learning process. But um, I think it's up to what Burning Man wants. Does Burning Man want this uh, diverse thing to happen now in the next few years? Or do they want to wait two decades? Hopefully there'll still be a Burning Man in two decades. And finally, we'll have um, representation out there so that things can change. Yeah. But um, that's, that's the main thing that I'm talking about. You know, a lot of what Smitty was saying uh, about like, the, you're going to get all these people always. So just the biggest way to change it is to have black folks and people of color on the ground. Burning Man can accelerate that. And we're doing the work out here. Yeah. Thank you, Kobe. All right, we are down to our last open mic uh, person who is Moonshine, who spoke earlier. So we want to just give him another pass uh, to share some more thoughts and then we'll wrap up. Thank you all for staying on extra long. Moonshine. Yes, yes, thank you. And thank you for giving me another uh, opportunity to express myself. Um, yeah, that first time I was thinking about the four minutes and um, also thinking about what's happening in this country in regards to uh, race and, and all of that. But uh, to touch on, on Burning Man, my first year was, was 2010. Um, and I was uh, invited by a, a, a group of my, my white friends. So I, I had um, some folks around me to, to help me, one, understand the principles um, and just a lot of the small nuances that someone who has never been uh, won't pick up or, or, or won't get. Um, the, the principles are, are solid, right? Uh, you look at the United States, the Bill of Rights are solid. You know, a, a lot of the, the, the laws and the things that are in place are solid. They just don't apply to everyone. Um, so moving forward with, with Burning Man, I think if we all as the community um, and Burning Man organization as, as the, the ones that sort of govern uh, everything, if, if we could think about how to uh, apply Make sure that, that, that everyone attends, gets a chance to, to um, 
experience those principles for what they are. Uh, I think we, we, we can go a long way. Um, 2017 was my, my son's first year and he was 19 at the time. Um, um, I'm from New York originally. I lived in Chicago for nine years. I've been on the West coast now for about 10. Um, and my son's from Chicago and the, uh, his experience is looking at his experience and, and not my own. Cause by then I'd had, you know, six or seven years under my belt, um, seven or eight years under my belt. So um, I wouldn't say I was jaded, but I had a, a different understanding, but looking at his experience, uh, you know, a, a young black male uh, in America and, and how, what he was taking in um, it, it really sort of showed me that it's, it's about, it's about opportunity uh, for those who, who really, it's not even, I wouldn't even say it's on a radar. It's, it's not something that um, is, is uh, thought to be possible. Um, so uh, as we move forward, I know we're talking, that we, soon we'll start talking about actions that we can take and solutions. Um, a lot of it's going to have to be, again, really proactive. We're going to, we're going to as a community, going to have to reach out and affect those, those uh, Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color. Um, I'm not gonna take up this whole four minutes. I do want to say one thing to Chris. Uh, thanks for your your share. Um, as as the, the country goes through all of these shifts and changes, uh, my, my heart and my attention and my love goes out to the Indigenous people of this land that we are all on because they are uh, the, the owners, if you will, or the, the original peoples of this land. So I cannot imagine as, as everything that happens in this country and everyone sort of wanting um, access and opportunities um, that we, we have to keep in mind that all of us, even the folks that were uh, brought here as, as slaves, um, we, are, we are all on, on indigenous folks land. So we all have changed the lives of the indigenous people from this land in major ways. Um, so if we can just keep that in mind and, and try to, to not forget that we, we have to um, think about each other in the sense of like, okay, sure, I didn't have a, a racist experience, um, but that doesn't mean that somebody else didn't. Um, and that's how I, I sort of look at things going forward. Again, I've had some very good experiences and I've had some bad experiences, but I spent a lot of time thinking about the experiences of others and how I can help bring everyone to uh, to sort of share a similar experience and have the same opportunities. Um, it's great seeing all of you. I, I really do hope that we uh, have a chance to get out on Playa 2021 um, so I can make some new friends and, and camp in some new spots. Peace and love. Thank you, Moonshine. Uh, we already gave our closing thoughts, so I'm not going to say the same thing over again. But, um, you know, when we came into this, we were trying to figure out the scope of what we were dealing with. And so I, I feel like we've heard so many stories today. And for every story that was told, there's many more that aren't told. So um, I hope over time we can help surface these and think together about how to address this for our community. So stay tuned. There will be a lot more that we share. Um, and, you know, sometimes we want the train to go a lot faster than it can move, but we are moving it as fast as we can. Uh, but thank you all for spending tonight with us and with each other. I'm going to pass it to Molly Rose to say yep. final comments. Thanks, Lovell. And thank you to, um, again, all of the speakers, the 80 people who stayed on for almost three hours, the um, couple hundred folks who have been joining us through the Facebook Live. This is, the, this is only the beginning, and we love you so much. And so we're going to end this call so that you can all go be in your lives. Um, so have a great night, everybody.